Good evening. We'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting order at 7.01 p.m. December 1st. I'd like to welcome all of you that are here with us this evening. If we could just take a moment for silent meditation, please. Thank you. Pledge. <coughs> Mr. Clerk, as you call the roll, please. Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. Council Member Brown. Here. Council Member Katati. Council Member Davis. Here. Council Member Moffitt. Here. And Council Member Shule. Thank you. Let me ask, are there any announcements by members of the council? If not, I, I guess I'd like to make an announcement. At our last work session, uh, I got in a call from uh, other people gotten calls about what was happening on Fayetteville Street. And uh, that's a road that uh, we've had a lot of complaints about in terms of the condition that it was in. And it's a road that we've had to explain that it's one of the streets. This is, I'm talking about Fayetteville Street near North Carolina Central University from 147 to Cornwall and Slow at least or beyond. Uh, we've had to constantly explain that that's not a street that's under the city's jurisdiction is uh, maintained by the North Carolina Department of Transportation. And we've had several conversations with them, uh, hoping to get them to move. Well, they finally moved, so uh, we were pleased with that, but uh, they are going to supposedly complete that work by the end of the, end of the year. But uh, it's another example of, um, we've done a lot of street resurfacing in the city of Durham through uh, barns that have been passed uh, but there are several streets that are not under our control, they're under state control, and Federal Street was one of them, but that's finally getting repaired in condition, so we appreciate the state for doing that. Since no one else had anything to say, I just thought I'd throw that out. Uh, having said that, I'm going to ask, are there prior items by the city manager? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Uh, no priority items. Uh, likewise, uh, city attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items. And likewise, city clerk. No items, Mr. Mayor. Okay, we'll proceed with the agenda. Uh, the first items are the consent agenda, and consent agenda items may be approved by a single vote by, if no council member or public pulls an item. If an item is pulled, then we'll discuss that later in the agenda. Uh, item one is approval of city council minutes. Item two is the Durham City County Appearance Commission appointment. Item three is the citywide strategic plan performance audit report, October 2014. Item four is the take home vehicle performance audit report, October 2014. Item five is the comprehensive annual financial report for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2014. Item six is FY15-16 budget development schedule. Item seven is memorials on city property or right of ways, and I'll pull that item. Item eight is 2015 city council meeting schedule. Item nine is U 3308 North County 55 Austin Avenue widening municipal agreement. Item 10 is the bid report for October 2014. Item 11 is Maplewood and Beachwood Cemeteries design contract amendment one colon Jewel Thames PA. Item 12 is the proposed acquisition of 320 Maldi Street for the Department of Transportation sign and signal shop operations. Item 13 is FY 2014 Burn Criminal Justice Innovation Program Planning Grant Award. We'll pull that item. Item 14 is setting a public hearing to consider rescinding the ordering of 11 petition sidewalk projects. And item 16 to 20 are the items that can be found on the general business agenda at public hearings. Entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda with exception items 7 and 13. So it's been properly moved by the Mayor Pro Tem. Seconded by Councilman Brown. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Will you close the vote? If 
passes seven to zero. Thank you. We'll move to the general business or general public hearings. Item 16 is Unified Development Ordinance Text Amendment, Unipol Freestanding Wireless Communications Facility. Uh, thank you very much. Michael Stock with the Planning Department. Uh, before I begin, staff certifies that all required notifications for this and the following Planning Department related public hearings have been performed and are on file for review. Text Amendment TC 140004 is a privately initiated amendment by Morningstar Law Group to Unified Development Ordinance to allow Unipoles, or also known as Slick Sticks, uh, freestanding wireless communication facilities to be considered concealed in all non-residential districts except commercial neighborhood, in all planned districts except for uh, PDR districts, and in all design districts. This would expand the range of allowable zoning districts where this type of a wireless communication facility could be located and would allow approval within these districts to be administrative instead of requiring a special use permit. Uh, the specific text amendment application is found in attachment A. Examples of such facilities have been included in attachment B. The draft ordinance prepared by staff to attachment D attempts to provide clarity to the request while maintaining the intent of the applicant by creating a separate category instead of classifying a unit pool as concealed or non-concealed. Also, in order to provide some consistency with other types of freestanding towers, unipoles are proposed to be allowed in the RR and RS20 districts, but only with a special use permit, which is also consistent with non-concealed wireless communication facility approvals. Staff recommends approval, but would prefer to incorporate this amendment into the overall revisions to the wireless communication facility ordinance standards. Uh, TC 12-00013 that have been under consideration by the Joint City County Planning Committee with impending uh, subsequent public hearings. The applicant was provided the options to either incorporate the request into the overall revisions or to move forward with this request ahead of the, those revisions. The applicant has chosen to initiate the approval process ahead of the overall revisions in order to take advantage of both the current setback standards and the current exemption of concealed freestanding wireless communication facilities from the Meyer Special Proofs use permit process. The overall WCF revisions may propose changes to both of these current UDO provisions. The Planning Commission recommended approval 7 to 2 of the text amendment on October 14, 2014. The Planning Commission determined that the request, uh, requested amendment is consistent with the adopted comprehensive plan and that it is reasonable and in public interest based upon comments received at the public hearing and information in the staff report. As a reminder, Council will be required to take two actions. The first action it will be a vote on the ordinance amendment itself, and that again is attachment D in your agenda packet. The second action will be a vote on the appropriate statement of consistency, which is found in attachment E of your agenda packet. The applicant is here to answer any questions, and thank you. I'll be also happy to answer any questions. Thank you. This is a public hearing. I would ask other first comments by members of the Council on the staff report. I recognize Councilman Mock. Uh, I just wanted to ask one question. Uh, the staff report referenced uh, TC 1200013. When do you think that will be in front of the governing bodies? We're looking at um, hopefully, I'd like to get it to Planning Commission uh, January, February, and then following the schedule. So you're looking at late uh, winter, early spring, hopefully. We had to wait for. Um, there was a special order and ruling from the FCC on some federal legislation that came out in mid-October. Mid and coinciding with reviewing that with the attorney's offices, it's just unfortunately kind of pushed things back a little bit. Mm -hmm. Any other questions about members of the council? Council, I'll take Okay, before we hear from the uh, proponents, uh, I have two persons that have signed up to speak in opposition to this item. I'd like to know, is there anyone else that wants to speak? I have Dolly Fehrenbacher and uh, Mel Fehrenbacher. Is there anyone else that wants to speak in opposition to this, to this item? If not, then uh, we will allow 10 minutes on each side for this and recognize uh, Patrick Biker. Good evening, Mayor Bell. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden, members of the City Council. My name is Patrick Biker. I live at 2614 Stewart Drive. I'm an attorney with Morningstar Law Group. I'm here tonight representing Durham Tower LLC for this text amendment. With me tonight from Durham Tower is one of its founding partners, Matthew Danielson. You've just heard the staff report, and we very much appreciate the Planning Department's and the Planning Commission's support for the terms of this proposal. We're here tonight to request your approval for this text amendment that will promote 
the installation of unipoles, sometimes referred to as slick sticks, through an administrative approval process. We want to stress that we are only requesting this administrative approval process for non-residential zones. In short, we think this is a text amendment to incentivize good behavior. And now to show you what we're ta talking about with the term unipoles, here's a picture from Cary. This picture was taken on the Triangle Expressway, uh, the extension of the Durham Freeway going into Wake County. So you can see the 195-foot tall unipole in the center of this picture. And to give you a reference point, uh, it's probably could, could, could I stop you for yes, a moment? Yes, sir, of course. Are we standing back here? It's not on this screen oh. here. Okay. That's beyond my control. I understand. That's why, I, <laughs> that's why I'm stopping you. I'm going to find I, I, I appreciate that. This Good. is one of my better PowerPoints, too. <laughs> I mean, we don't have a problem turning our backs, but we've got all these monitors yeah, I'm sorry. to be able to see Uh-oh, I've lost it, too. Have other slides in your presentation? Is that the slide? No, no, it's, I got like uh, half a dozen more, you know, yeah, eight well. or nine more slides. Shucks. Well, well, I certainly don't want to take up the council's time, so if you just want me to talk about it, then we can move move ahead. And if you have any questions, maybe we can... Uh, they can't do it. Okay, go ahead, Patrick. We'll turn our no heads. <laughs> Sorry, Mayor. Um, so anyway, this picture was on the Triangle Expressway. You can see the 195-foot tall unipole in the center of this picture. Uh, it's about a half mile north of the USA Baseball Complex in uh, Cary. Oh, are you all going to take a look at that? Anyway. No yeah, <laughs> sorry. I, I, I appreciate it. Um, what distinguishes the unipolar slick stick is that all the antenna hardware is inside the pole and nothing is mounted externally. To be very frank about the proposal that's before you tonight, we essentially borrowed the concept in its entirety from the Cary zoning ordinance. I'd like to contrast the unipole and Cary with some pictures I took while going around in Durham. Here are two towers with external antenna. The one on the left is on the Durham Freeway at Alexander Drive and Research Triangle Park. The one on the right is on Hillsborough Road next to the Wendy's that's just past 15501. So this, those are cell towers in non-residential zones. However, you can also see these types of external antenna in residential areas. The one on the left is an apartment complex on Highway 55, just north of Cornwallis, and the tower on the right is an apartment complex on Maureen Road. I'd like to contrast the visual appearance of how that Unipol and Cary looks from a residential neighborhood. As you can see, it presents much less visual clutter. Now, what's currently allowed in Durham by administrative approval is the monopine. Maybe it's just me, but I think it would look odd to have the monopine sort of tower in a non-residential zone. And now to conclude, we have a specific location for the unipole we wish to install. It's along Pettigrew Street in a light industrial zone close to Durham, Techn Durham Technical Community College. I hope all of you had the opportunity to review the letter uh, that's in tonight's agenda package from the president of Durham Tech to plan director Steve Medlin emphasizing the need for improved cellular coverage in the Durham Tech area. We think this is a great location for implementing this type of cell tower because it will minimize visual clutter and improve service for Durham Tech students and faculty. This new tower also will enhance safety because 75% of 911 calls currently come from cell phones. Also, in terms of community appearance, we can avoid uh, installing a monopine at this industrial location. And so for all these reasons, we respectfully ask for your approval, and I'll be happy to try to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Are there questions from the staff on the proposal as presented? Thank you. You're welcome. I'd like to rec recognize Dolly Ferenbacher and Mel Ferenbacher. Uh, either one of you can come.
If you could just state your name and address, please. Uh, Dolly Fahrenbacher. I'm the president of the Good Neighbors of 751 Durham. I live at 4 O'Quinn Court in Durham, North Carolina, 27713. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak today. Uh, this request to make the Unipol concealed would change the height restrictions of a concealed tower in the RR and RS zones from 120 to 199 feet in the present UDO with no increase to setbacks in any of the zoned areas. And under preliminary proposed WCF text changes thus far created by citizens, planning, and industry, the Unipol defined as a concealed tower would open the door to allow 60-foot Unipol towers as defined Thank you. Um, now I forgot where I was at. Um, the Unipol defined as a concealed tower could open the door to allow 60 foot Unipol towers as defined concealed to be placed in any zone by administrative approval only and then be allowed to grow heights in a new, numerous increments again by administrative approval only. The set safety setbacks that we are working to get implemented will be compromised with the future text and of course and are not in the present UDO text. In conclusion, we feel that the timing and the major conversion of the Unipol in a concealed tower would be better for the community if revisited after the major WCF text changes have been approved. It's our understanding that they are able to go ahead with approval through, uh, 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 through the uh, Board of Adjustment to get the, this specific site approved. So we ask that you please do not make this a part of the text change. Thank you. Again, if you could just state your name and address, please. Yes. My name is Mel Fahrenbacher. I live at 4 Oakwind, and I'm speaking tonight on behalf of Carol Baldwin for the Bucks Crossing neighborhood. We first want to thank the council members and Mayor Bell that in November 2012 at Citizens Matters, you responded to our request for resident involvement in the process that puts high-rise wireless businesses in residential zones. That day, you authorized revising Durham's UDO wireless regulations toward what you called citizen engagement, and that's a quote. We also thank the planning department and industry, as well as Inc., for working diligently through 2013 and, and to date to create wireless regulations that address residents' concerns for the safety and quality of our neighborhoods. Now it looks like the goal of resident mindful wireless revisions to the UDO has hit a bump in the road. Just when JCCPC has told neighborhoods that the comprehensive amendment TC1200013 version revising section 5 on wireless facilities is about to conclude, council is asked to vote on an amendment that would change the UDO for just one wireless structure design. There are parts of the Unipol Amendment, TC140004, that seem in conflict with the more comprehensive TC120013. So why move on the latter until these are resolved? Thank you. You're welcome. Are there questions? Again, this is a public hearing before I close the public hearing. I want to know if there's anyone else that wants to speak on this particular item. Good. Sure. State your name and address. You have... Uh, I would need to hold on a minute, Mr. Mayor. I, I'm going to tell you how many minutes you have. You don't have to take them. You have three minutes. Thank so, you, yeah. Ms. McGill. I was just curious on something that I thought I heard, so I just want to make sure. Did they mention the tower is going to be over by Durham Tech? So that's, did somebody mention that about the towers being the, on? It's on East Pettigrew Street. It's the location that we've identified and we submit to the planning department. Uh, when was that, Matthew? 
Yeah, it was, it was eight or nine months ago. I just, and my other question, will those towers um, bring about um, radiation in the air? I do know uh, when you deal with your, when you deal with your electrical uh, lines, they do. So will these towers do that? And also my other concern, uh, the residents uh, that live in some of these areas, I, I don't live that far from Derm Tech and that whole McDuka Terrace area, all those uh, housing, uh, because it does sound like it's gonna cover a, a sort of a broad area. So, so my question would be also, were the residents told uh, about this who live in the other areas where this tower, uh, if you're speaking about wireless, uh, wireless covers a broad, a broad area. And also, um, will you be using fiber uh, for your towers also, for underground, I don't know. So those are some of the questions. The main thing is, will it release radiation in the air? And if it is, and if it's going to, were the residents in those surrounding communities besides Derm Tech, were they notified and told about any meetings or hearings? I, I know oh, I'm a homeowner in that area and, and I have not received anything. So that's why, Mr. Mayor, I, I wanted just to say. All right, Ms. Peterson, I think they are prepared to respond to your questions. Just to clarify, Mayor Bell, all the surrounding property is zoned industrial or industrial light. We're not aware of any residents being within 500 feet of the site that we're looking at. And Matthew, if you would address the radiation issue and any other concerns. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the council. My name is Matthew Danielson. Uh, our office is located at 201 South uh, Albemarle Street. And to answer your question regarding radiation, no. Cell towers do not uh, give off radiation, so there would be no concern for that. Uh, I, I would like to make one point. Unfortunately, uh, you didn't see the PowerPoint presentation. Tomorrow, I could go to planning staff and get approved a 195-foot monopine. Yeah, I, again, I'm not sure if you saw that. And that's administratively approved today as the ordinance is written. We believe that cell towers, and in fact, if I may ask the audience a quick question, who here doesn't own a cell phone? So when we're talking about cell towers, we're talking about public infrastructure. And so the, the idea here is to allow the wireless industry to come in in an industrial area to put in the least obtrusive possible cell tower. That's a, sli uh, a slick stick. Uh, we have a letter, I believe it's in your package, from the State Historic Preservation Office asking us to put a slick stick here. Not, they, they do not want a monopine, because again, that's the most obtrusive thing you could see. And yet again, I could go before uh, the, the uh, planning staff tomorrow, get a monopine administratively approved, but not a slick stick. It just doesn't uh, make sense. And I'd be more than happy to answer any more questions you or the audience may have. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Recognize Councilman Shule. Public hearing is still open. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a question for the staff. Um, the, in terms of the timing, um, the report says, although staff considers a request to be reasonable, staff would prefer the changes to be incorporated within instead of ahead of the or overall revisions to the WCF standards. Um, can you talk about the timing, when, when we think those will be prepared, and can you talk a little bit about your reasons for thinking that should be done as part of this process rather than separately? Um, the timing, it, we're looking at most likely late winter, early spring at the earliest. Um, a draft that is out for public review right now was released back in September. Um, and then we were planning on moving forward with it. It was after a JCCPC final direction that was given in August. Um, and then uh, uh, things happened with uh, the Federal Communication Commission where they released uh, their, uh, how they see the rules from federal statutes to be interpreted. And thus we needed to take a step back and make sure we weren't doing double the work. Uh, so we're moving forward. Uh, at this point, again, we're looking at late, hopefully late winter or early spring at the earliest. Um, we thought 
that for some of the reasons that were brought up by uh, the Fehrenbachers, that there was a lot of uh, public input put in with the overall revisions, and the draft that's out there now actually reflects what you're seeing, seeing today in terms of where the, the unipoles would be allowed, um, but we thought um, there was reasonableness to package it all together so you're not seeing multiple revisions to a WCF ordinance in such a short period of time. And Mr. Mayor, if I might, um, Mr. Biker, how do you respond to that? Because you're the, you talked about the, the monopons and the, the uh, as opposed to what th this would look like, and I think we could all agree that would be superior, and this gentleman, I'm sorry I forgot your name, but made this point as well. Um, is there some reason that you are wanting to move this along that's compelling? Because I, I do see the interest of the public in having mm -hmm. this all be a package that this has been, as you know, discussed for some time. Oh, yeah. uh, and, and there's been a lot of public input. And, and I do have some concern that, that people will feel like that, that process being short-circuited in the interest mm -hmm. of one, one institution or, or one, one client's uh, interests. Yeah, yes, thank you for that question, Council Member Shul. Uh, if I'm, I believe I'm understanding Mr. Stock correctly, we're, we're looking at a good six months from today before the, the, the uh, text amendment could be before the City Council. Um, we feel that's a long time for Durham Tech to continue to have to put up with the, the cell service issues that they have right now. And um, again, this is, uh, we all drive the Durham Freeway frequently. And it's, um, we, working through this issue, we did work with the planning department to investigate the monopine option, and that simply seems like a bad outcome to have to put that up in the short term when this text amendment would take care of that problem. So um, we feel that six months is a fairly long wait, um, and that's obviously every people, reasonable people can differ on that issue, but uh, that's how we feel about it. We obtained this letter from uh, President Ingram uh, in late June of this year, and so as you can see, this issue was brought to our attention, July, August, September, you know, five months ago, and we're still trying to resolve it. So, that's uh, our that's our feeling on it. To us, six months feels like a long time. Maybe, maybe it isn't, but that's that's how we feel. Recognize, uh, uh, city manager had a question too, but I'm going to recognize the council person first. Yeah, Councilwoman, uh, go ahead. I recognize you. Thank you. I just had a question for staff to clarify. Michael, you indicated that uh, you completed the review of the uh, the FCC questions. We have, and we met with uh, the city and county attorney's offices last week, I believe. And so we're still waiting to, um, we have one more time to meet with the industry and uh, the neighborhoods to kind of go over last uh, remaining comments and issues, and then we'd like to move forward with uh, the actual public hearing process. So, so as it relates to the, you know, the, the standards around this monopole, do you anticipate that the standards that you'll be recommending will be different or the same as what is included in this proposal? I, the standards I thought you said that might be different, but I wasn't clear about that. They, they would be different. Um, what's being worked out are greater setbacks, your, your base, Basically, you're looking at needing larger lots to place almost any freestanding tower. What, regardless of the zoning district? Correct. Thank you. Correct. I recognize Councilwoman Katati. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to clarify with staff, um, the special use permit process, are they eligible to proceed through that with this, um, the monopole? Uh, for the unipole, yes. Yes, unipole. they would, or, or for a standard monopole, yes, they would. They're currently classified as a non-concealed tower, so they would follow that approval process. Yeah, that's what I thought. And um, I believe that Mr. Biker brought this before JCCPC in August, is that correct? I believe so, yes. Right, and it is now December, so at that time we had also suggested perhaps you proceed with the special use permit, and you could have been well into that process. Um, I'll just say that I prefer that um, these changes be approached with the overall revisions uh, to the wireless communication facilities and not separately and I do believe it should stay as a special use permit. 
and public hearing in the interest of citizens. We've been hearing about uh, wireless communication facilities and citizen concerns for so many years. I really don't want to do a separate process. Thank you. Recognize Councilman Moffitt. Yeah, I have a Baker. question for Mr. Baker, or for one of you. Um, uh, yeah. Since you, since this has been stated, this is for the um, cell tower near Durham Tech, and uh, since it, uh, you could do it with a special use permit, and you've been interested in doing this since August, what, can you tell us why you didn't pursue a special interest permit, a special use permit? It was tracking to get to the city council uh, before uh, it would have gotten to the Board of Adjustment, and we were fortunate to have a 7-2 vote for approval from the Planning Commission, so we took that as a positive indication that the community was, was okay with this process. And to be perfectly frank with you, we'd be willing to only have the slick sticks allowed in industrial light zones. I mean, we could put office or whatever to the side because that's really the only one that we're interested in is the uh, industrial type zoning to provide this service for people who who need it. Uh, I, I, it's, it seems to me that the odds of or the probability of, of people being concerned about a, a slick stick in an, in an industrial light zoning district is very low given the other uses that are permitted there as of right. I know, I'm, yes, thank you. Um, the, the question I was wondering is since this has been stated as for a single particular site, mm -hmm. at some point way back there was a decision to um, pursue this avenue rather than a special use permit, mm -hmm. right? But long right. before the Planning Commission, and, and, long. And it's exactly for the reasons that we talked about. It's to incentivize good behavior, to uh, ask people like Matthew to really look hard at commercial, office, and industrial zones before they look at residential. Okay. Then I have a question for staff, for Michael. Uh, Mr. Stock, uh, the in the revisions that you're contemplating, would you, uh, absent this application, would you consider unipoles to be concealed or unconcealed in those? Well, we would take the same tact that we're doing now. Um, in fact, it was brought up at JCCPC that unipoles don't fit neatly into either definition. So the tact that we took in this and what we would and which we would follow through even if in a revision would just give Unipol its own category but maintain the intent, or at least we maintain the intent of the applicant per their application. So we didn't define it as concealed, we didn't define it as non-concealed, we kept it as Unipol and gave it its own definition within the definition section. But you're treating it as the same we're, as we're concealed. Keeping it, the intent is to treat it with the same approval process as right. concealed, but we're not defining it as concealed. And if I understood the staff report, you feel like that's reasonable yes. and prudent? Yes. Thank you. Recognize Councilman Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I guess I have some concern that has been voiced by some of my colleagues about um, the possibility of our curbing <coughs> citizen input. And um, I guess if I had to choose, and since the, um, um, the, the vendor here has a, had a choice between going through that process after we have received more citizen input uh, as opposed to going forth tonight, I guess I would side with the idea of going through the uh, process, that, the open hearing process and the final decisions by the JC, JCCPC. Um, and um, I am, would be opposed to moving forward without that citizen input. Thank you. Are, are there other questions or comments? I, I, I like Ms. Lauren Becker, if you could come back. No, not Patrick, Dolly, where is she? Baron Becker. Could you come back? I, I had a question about, I wanted to understand one of the concerns that you raised. Uh, you spoke about the height being, a, being extended. Well, could you repeat that again? Oh, it was written? Okay. Um. The request would make the unipole concealed, would change the height restrictions of a concealed tower in RR and RS zones from 120 to 199 in the present UDO, with no increase of setbacks 
in the zones area. For respond to that. Uh, the height restrictions actually do not change for those zoning districts. Um, the RR and RS20 districts are would be 120 feet, and they would main, remain 120 feet, and they would require also the minor special use permit. Okay, thank you. Did, did you understand that? Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to close the public hearing on this item, uh, and matters back before the council for uh, consideration. Entertain a motion on this item. Mr. Mayor, I'll move the item with the intention of voting no. Is there a second to that motion? Second. It's been properly moved and second. Any further discussion? Councilman Katari move. Councilman Sewell second. Is it clear? Uh, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote, please? Will you close the vote? The motion fails six to one with council member Moffitt voting yes. Is it? You, so who else is voting no? You, okay, so Mayor Pro Tem is voting no also, so it fails. Okay, that matters has been covered. Let's move to the next item on the agenda, please. No, it, excuse me for one, one moment. Yes, sir. We, even though the motion failed, you, by state statute, you still have to approve the, do the second part and approve the consistency statement. There's a second part of, on even that though, attachment that is failed. if the motion fails. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you Good just have to move mm -hmm. the appropriate consistency statement based upon the failure of the- a Entertain a motion. That's all. Oh, no or yes? Uh, you vote to just approve yes for the appropriate consistency statement. The option is as if the motion fails, you would vote on that one. We, we, we need to make sure we need clarification. This is the first time we've done this. Good evening, Steve Medlin with the Durham City County Planning Department. Attachment E of your document actually is the consistency statement. Uh, if you look at the bottom of, uh, of that attachment, you'll see in the event that the uh, motion to approve the ordinance fails, there is actually a consistency statement. We're asking that you approve that consistency statement. Okay, are we clear on this? Okay, so who, who has the motion? Who made the motion? Council Moffitt, who second? Councilman Shule. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. <laughs> Item, I'm sorry. Item 17, comprehensive plan amendment. Irwin Terrace at LaSalle Street, A13000010. Good evening, Mayor Bell, members of Council, Pat Young with the Planning Department. Uh, the case before you is A13000010, Irwin Terrace at LaSalle Street. The applicant is seeking to change the tier designation of 19.64 uh, acres of property on the north side of Irwin Road at its intersection with South LaSalle Street from its current tier designation of urban to the compact neighborhood tier. Uh, this is an existing mixed-use development on a portion of this site. At this location, um, the applicant has represented that they've maximized their residential density under the urban tier designation, and the proposed compact tier designation, uh, excuse me, compact neighborhood tier designation would allow increased density and a more transit-oriented design of the site as city policy encourages through the uh, comp plan for future transit stations. Uh, staff finds that the request to change the tier designation meets the four criteria for comprehensive plan changes as outlined in detail in your staff report and recommends approval. Uh, Planning Commission recommended approval by a vote of nine to one at its October 2014 meeting. Thank you, I'll be happy to take any questions. Again, this is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. I'll ask first other questions by members of the council and staff report. Hearing none, we'll move to the public for comments. And again, to make sure we have all persons that have signed up to speak on this item. Uh, so I can determine the amount of time for each speaker. We have Judith Wegner as a proponent, Robinson Everett as a proponent, Dan Jewell as a proponent, and Patrick Biker as an opponent, as a proponent. 
Is there anyone else that wants to speak in support of this item? Okay, in terms of those persons who are signed up to speak in opposition, uh, Drana Freeman, Jen Sarara, Reba Hicks, Vicki Ryder, and Larissa Seibel. Now, is there anyone else whose name I have not called that would like to speak on this item? Okay, let's let's assume that we've got 15 minutes. And Mr. The, Mayor, I'd like to defer till item 18. I didn't know uh, how to sign up for this, if I could. I'm Judith Wedner. Okay. Uh, Melissa Norton, Norton. Norton, okay, as an opponent and. Selena Mack as an opponent. Does anyone else who wants to speak in opposition? Uh, that being the case, let's, let's go with 15 minutes each. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Make it 21 minutes. Each person has three minutes to speak. I recognize um, Patrick Biker. Good. Good evening, Mayor Bell, Mayor Pro Tem, Cole McFadden, members of the City Council. My name is Patrick Biker. I live at 2614 Stewart Drive. I'm an attorney with Morningstar Law Group in Durham. I'm here tonight representing Irwin Terrace Limited Liability Company for this comprehensive plan amendment. With me tonight from Irwin Terrace is its manager, Robinson Everett, as well as our landscape architect, Dan Jewell. We also have our design architect, Darren Lathan of Duda Payne, our project manager, Robert Everett of NEMA Management, our financial advisor, Keith Wells of Northmark Capital, and Andrew Tapp, our traffic engineer. You've just heard the staff report, and we appreciate the planning department's and the planning commission's support for this plan amendment. We are here tonight to request your approval of this plan amendment that will continue the strong success we have as a community have seen over the past 15 years with turning Irwin Road from a fairly lackluster suburban low-density corridor into a vibrant, lively, mixed-use environment that serves residents, workers, and visitors to Durham extremely well. First of all, it is important to note that this corner of Irwin and LaSalle today is served by three Durham Area Transit Authority bus routes and two bus routes operated by Triangle Transit. I know some of you on the council will recall that I served eight years on the Durham Area Transit Authority, many of those years as chairman or vice chair. If I were still in that role, I would recognize that it makes no sense to have the city's current boundary for the compact neighborhood tier end at LaSalle Street when we as taxpayers are supporting so much bus service at this intersection right now. In order to capitalize on our community's investment in bus service at this intersection, we need compact neighborhood standards to include these 20 acres, and that is exactly the proposal that's before the council tonight. Second, we wish to note that this application has been under review for just over a year. Our team submitted this application in November 2013. We wish to emphasize that the detailed review by the planning department has not disclosed any negative impacts from creating this new compact neighborhood tier designation. I think the success we have seen during the redevelopment of Irwin Road over the past 15 years shows that this section of Durham thrives under the compact neighborhood standards rather than the urban tier standards. Third, the fact that Triangle Transit unilaterally elected to create a proposed light rail transit station at the intersection of LaSalle and Irwin reflects the necessity for implementing the compact neighborhood tier at this location. Of course, this light rail transit proposal was supported by a strong majority of Durham County's voters who turned out in support of the transit referendum a couple of years ago. To leave the current urban tier standards in place at this location will hamstring our efforts to demonstrate Durham is implementing sound land use planning principles to support Triangle Transit's proposal to the Federal Transit Administration. And so to follow through, on supporting both existing bus service and potential rail transit at this location and to recognize the logical extension of the strong redevelopment along this section of Irwin Road, we respectfully ask for the Council's approval of this plan amendment. And now our landscape architect, Dan Jewell, will address the history of this corridor and how it has benefited from design that interacts well with transit and pedestrian activities. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, good evening. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Manager, members of the council, I am Dan Jewell of 1025 Glory Avenue, president of Coulter Jewell Thames. Uh, as many of you know, I'm very passionate about our community's need to grow in a more thoughtful and urban manner. I've worked tirelessly for many years to help create a transit corridor in Durham 
that will promote denser, more sustainable pattern of building. When I worked with Robinson's father 15 years ago to create the very first vertical mixed use project in Durham, Irwin Terrace, our goal was to set an example of a better way for Durham to grow, to create a place where folks could live, shop, dine, and work in one location within walking distance of major employment centers and on existing bus routes. Our proposal, while modest compared to the other more recent developments on Irwin Road, seemed like a stretch at the time. Even though at that time we were still six years away from the adoption of the current comprehensive plan, which created the notion of a compact neighborhood around future transit stops, the City Council at that time strongly endorsed our zoning application, and so we became the pioneers for the pattern of growth on Irwin Road that you see today. Fast forward to just a few years ago, when Rob and I first started talking about the possibilities of expanding Irwin Terrace to meet the demand that was there. The very reasonable proposal that's before you tonight will afford even more opportunity for people to live, work, and shop in a walkable place and provide a way to accommodate some of Durham's projected growth in a manner that is less dependent on suburban expansion. We've been in discussion with TTA about how our proposal accommodates the future light rail station by providing plazas and spaces for retail shops along the frontage to serve those transit riders. And this proposal embodies what I've been working for for years to help Durham achieve and to make this corner worthy of a new compact neighborhood. 15 years down the road now, we're again, ask, again asking you to allow us to be pioneers for great Durham growth. And now you'll hear from Robinson Everett, the lead developer with Irwin Terrace. Thanks, Dan. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of City Council. My name is Robinson Everett, Jr. I grew up in Durham, and I live here now at 8 Chancery Place. I'm proud to say that the original build-out of this project has indeed contributed greatly to the success of this city. I grew up on LaSalle Street, uh, just a couple of blocks away from Irwin Road. And at that time, and until very recently, Irwin Road was quite dormant. Today, it's one of the largest growth corridors in the city. When it was built, Irwin Terrace was dense and ambitious. Today, as you've heard from Dan, we're the little de development on the block. But we stand at a corner that remains primed for further business growth. And this plan amendment will allow us to continue where the first phase left off. It will provide more mixed-use amenities in Durham in a walkable setting across from a medical center and university research corridor that other cities across this country dream of having. Our application was indeed submitted November 6th of last year, but we actually began this process long before then with surveys and environmental reports and traffic studies and neighborhood meetings working hand-in-hand -hand with the Durham City staff to revise and resubmit. This request allows for more growth and density at the very location that Triangle Transit has already announced to the federal government that it intends to build transit. And such growth and density is essential to support transit. Our team recognizes that supporting transit also requires successful impl implementation of the council's resolution adopted in May 2014, six months after we submitted this plan amendment, and we look forward to being a participant, excuse me, a participant in the housing needs assessment and plan called for in that resolution. And we wish to as assist with addressing affordable housing the affordable housing issues by contributing $25,000 to the City of Durham administration. And we can address that in more detail during the zoning map change public hearing that's next on your agenda. That said, everything I've learned during this process over the past year plus has only confirmed to me that the proposed, uh, 
project is vitally important to Durham and makes sense as it is. The city staff has approved it. The Planning Commission has recommended approval. And throughout the process, we have received unwavering support from our commercial tenants, some are here, and neighbors. Indeed, our, our team has reached out to the only established neighborhood near to Irwin Terrace, the Crest Street neighborhood. We met with Mr. Willie Patterson, the president of Crest Street Community Council, to inform of the, him of this proposal. Mr. Patterson could not be here tonight, but he was kind enough to provide a letter of support, which we're making available to you now. And I would thank and like everyone who came out tonight in support of Irwin Terrace and all that it represents Durham to please stand up. Thank you. Accordingly, we respectfully ask for your approval and our team will be happy to try to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, let me ask, are there questions by members of the council of the proponent? Uh, if not, we move to those who are in opposition to this proposal. As I call your name, if you come to the podium to the right, uh, you have a total of 21 minutes. Each person has three minutes. Uh, Selena Mack, <coughs> Melissa Norton, DeBrain Freeman, uh, Jim Savara, Reba Higgs, Vicki Ryder, and Larissa Seibel. Uh, I would say that you can organize yourselves as you, as you choose. Each has three minutes. You just state your name and address as you come to the podium, please, to speak. Good evening. My name is Larissa Seibel. I'm representing Durham People's Alliance, and as you know, People's Alliance has advocated for homes affordable to all Durham residents for many years. And the city has worked to create and preserve housing opportunities for decades. However, there continues to be a need for affordable homes. 35,000 households in Durham are cost burdened. They are paying too much for rent and some too much for their mortgage. That, and then also we need homes uh, for people um, who are moving into our area, including veterans with disabilities who need services at the VA Med Medical Center. In fact, at, on Veterans Day, I heard from um, G.K. Butterfield that an additional 2,500 homes are needed for disabled veterans in this area. Recently, Durham has seen a huge increase in development, as you've just heard, with rents becoming unaffordable for average working people like teachers and firefighters, police officers, nursing assistants, and certainly out of reach of people who serve our food and clean our buildings. These higher rents are rippling out across the city. This year, rents increased 50 to $100 on average when we updated our rental guide. Over the past four years, rents went up $240 at Duke Manor Apartments, which is in this area and is being counted as affordable housing. But now the rents, instead of being in the 500 dollar range are going up to $770. Will these apartments be affordable tomorrow or in 10 years when the rail station is built or in 30 years when our children need these affordable apartments to get started? Durham needs incentives to preserve long-term affordable housing. Density given away in areas such as downtown and 9th Street has resulted in unaffordable housing. This amendment would give high density away and would actually decrease the percentage of homes affordable to working people with incomes under $35,000 a year. And with each development approved without affordable housing, homes become less and less affordable to working families. Therefore, we ask the City Council to wait 
to work with this developer and future developers in the transit areas to create mixed income communities with homes that are affordable to working people long term and where we may be able to um, subsidize housing that's affordable to people with disabilities, people on fixed in incomes such as seniors and other low wage working people. And I want to ask the people who came to support aff affordable housing to stand or hold their signs up. Or both. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I propose that those two groups go outside and fight it out. <laughs> Not violently, of course. Uh, again, if you could state your name and address, please. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. My name is Reba Hanks, and I'm a proud homeowner at 2119 Collier Drive, Durham, North Carolina, 27707. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak. I am one of two representatives speaking to you this evening from Durham CAN, which as you know stands for Durham Congregations, Associations, and Neighborhoods. The representative organization for me is Immaculate Conception Catholic Church. We at CAN are very, very encouraged that the City Council and the Board of Commissioners jointly adopted a resolution calling for a minimum goal of 15% affordable housing in residential developments built around and adjacent to propo the proposed light rail, transit stops. Our group of com community organizations City Council members, Mayor, Mr. Mayor, and Mr. City Manager. We are always for something. We're never against. In this instance, however, we urge that the Council do as Ms. Seibel suggested, wait and try to negotiate with this esteemed developer to create, uh, so as to prevent a precedent for future rezoning and zoning for residential development that will not include affordable housing. Let me just say that I moved to Durham six years ago uh, because my children uh, and grandchildren live here. It is a wonderful community and I have a real estate background and I have nothing against any developer and I certainly have nothing against any citizen. And I can assure you that the development that is going on in Durham because of your wise leadership and your receptivity to citizen action as a city, and I've lived in many places, you, we are going, we are far more committed and we are uh, creating a vibrant community. So this is not naysaying the Irwin, Wood, uh, Irwin Road developers in any way. But let's point out something that this Irwin Road parcel is directly in front of a proposed light rail station and it'll probably serve those employed by Duke University and its hospitals. We believe the provision of affordable housing by this transit station is vital to the many workers affiliated with Duke such as nursing and, uh, and patient assistants, nurses, and a host of administrative and support personnel. I thank you so much for letting me speak. Good night. All right. Uh, if, if you have written remarks and you would like to leave them for the clerk, uh, you can do so, so to be a part of the record. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Right. Next speaker. Also, Mr. Mayor, I didn't get her first name. Le Le My first name is Reba. It's like Reba, Reba McIntyre, but it's spelled R-H-E-B-A. You speak very well. Good evening. My name is Jim Savara. I live at 1114 Woodburn Road, and I am here trying to speak for uh, Yvonne Parra tonight. Uh, he would have been here speaking uh, for Can, but is, uh, is out of town. Uh, as we have heard uh, from, from Reba and from Larissa, the need is great for more affordable housing. 
the goal to have at least 15% affordable housing close to transit stations is a start, an important start, toward addressing that need. It also assures that people who live close to stations to a rail system that is constructed with large amounts of public funding are available to those with the greatest transportation needs and that this proximity is not an amenity that is limited to the affluent. We, I think, all support the goal of more sustainable development in Durham, but sustainability requires equity and inclusion. The fact that there is extensive market rate affordable housing close to the LaSalle Street Station now does not mean it will remain affordable when property values rise in the rail corridor in the future. To use current conditions as a reason for not doing anything now means that opportunities are lost, as Yvonne pointed out at a meeting in September. It is very difficult to come up with affordable housing once the high-end development is built. The affordable housing goal means that every development proposal should be viewed as an opportunity to expand affordable housing. All parties should look for the ingredients that can make it feasible to incorporate these units. Durham CAN has requested that the planning department re-examine the incentives that are offered to developers in order and make them more, more uh, varied and, and wider in order to make them more effective. Some have argued that it is not appropriate to apply a resolution approved in March to a project that has been in preparation for a longer period of time. The commitment of Durham to expand affordable housing, however, is not new. The incentive to developers has been to permit higher densities than would normally be permitted. Thus, for 10 years, the policy of the city has linked approval of higher densities to provision of affordable housing. This principle, along with the possibility of other incentives that might be provided in this case, should be applied. In addition to avoiding a bad precedent, uh, as Reba has mentioned, we, Durham CAN looks at this as an opportunity to provide a positive example, a positive outcome. We recommend that the city and the developer take the time to find a solution that will meet their respective goals and set the example of including affordable housing in new developments. A great Durham growth requires affordable housing. This is a wonderful project that we're hearing about, but why are affordable units left out? Thank you. You're welcome. Again, if you just state your name and Okay. Address, please. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Selena Mack. I'm the ex director of Durham Community Land Trustees at 1208 West Chapel Hill Street, Durham, North Carolina. Um, I just want to kind of reiterate a lot of what has already been said, and as much as we're not, I'm not so opposed to the um, the request for the compact neighborhood tier, but I'm opposed to the exclusion of um, affordable housing in this project. Um, this project and any future project should, um, certainly within a half mile of the transit station, it's vital that it include um, affordable housing. Um, and it's, not, it's crucial that we are not just looking at what is affordable today. I mean, I was at the planning, I mean, the planning commission's um, meeting, and I know that you know, what has been said is that there's a vast number of affordable housing units existing in this area today. Um, however, I think it, I want to really emphasize the fact that we can't just look at what's affordable today, that we have to look at um, what is permanently affordable or what will be affordable over an extended period of time. So if you're looking at housing other than um, land trust or public housing, most housing units um, will only remain affordable for a period of 15 um, to 30 years in the, in the case of um, tax credits. Um, in this case, most of the affordable housing units being counted um, are those of, of privately of a privately owned um, development, Duke Manor, where 900 of those units are actually being counted as affordable. But we we know we're, we're seeing rents there already rise. We know that those units are not going to remain affordable over the long haul. So ideally, I think when we when these such cases come before you for approval, 
you know, ideally we, we want to see 15, at least 15, a minimum of 15 percent of all housing, um, of all new housing being affordable in order to create a continuum of affordable housing units um, in existence. And while I recognize that the, the, the idea of managing affordable housing can be a kind of frightening experience or a frightening idea for uh, for-profit developers, um, it's important that if we're going to ask developers to create affordable housing units, that we are ready to offer a strategy for them to be successful. And there are many examples of, um, of such, ex uh, many examples of, of how nonprofit, for-profits have worked with nonprofits, um, have partnered with them um, on the development or have um, allowed them to manage the affordable housing units that have proven successful throughout the country. So regardless of how it's done, it's essential that developers be provided this toolkit in order to be successful. Thank you. You're welcome. Next speaker. Hi, good evening. My name is Vicki Ryder, and I have previously written to um, all of the members of our council about uh, my feelings on the need for affordable housing to be included in any proposal that is approved by this, uh, by this body. And I wanted to especially thank Diane Katati for responding to my, to my letter. Um, I'm, like the speakers before me, not speaking about um, what the, this development does bring, but what it has left out. Um, we support the development of uh, enhanced mass transit for the people of our city. We support intelligent urban design and walkable mixed-use communities. But we also must be mindful of providing affordable housing for our citizens. And so um, we have a message for, for our council tonight because the season approaches of goodwill and cheer. And so in that spirit, we grannies are here to ask that you do what we all know is right, approve zoning so poor folks can sleep well at night. There are too many folks sleeping out in the street, clutching their bundles, it's cold without heat. No place to call home and no blankets or bed. They're lucky if some of them even get fed when wages are too low to pay the high rent and folks are left homeless, not even a tent. It's time for a change and on that we agree. More affordable housing is what we all need. Now in this prosperous country, now wouldn't you think we could house all the homeless as quick as a wink? If we weren't spending billions on weapons of war, we'd have affordable housing for all of the poor. And right here in Durham, it's time to get down and provide decent housing for the poor in our town. With transit close by, that would be a great thing. So rezoning for housing and make our hearts sing. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's a uh, tough act to follow. Um, Good evening, Mayor Bell, um, Mayor Pro Temp, and City Council members. My name is Mel Norton. I live at 1102 Wall Street. And I'm here tonight, along with so many others, to advocate for an affordable housing component in the case that this density bonus is, is approved. Um, as many of you know, I spent five years with Downtown Durham, Inc., during which time um, I helped advocate for um, many successful public-private partnerships. And I think you can look around in downtown and our central neighborhoods and Ninth Street, and it's just completely astounding what these public-private partnerships have resulted in. It's a completely transformed central city. And during many of these discussions of these public-private partnerships, and affordable housing kind of came up, and the message was always, we're not quite there yet. You know, we're, we're just not quite there. And I'm here tonight to say that we are here. I think we can look around in any urban neighborhood, downtown Ninth Street, and we are here. 
we have succeeded and we are succeeding. Um, when it comes to affordable housing policy, I think something that's important to keep in mind is that density is our key way of getting affordable units. Um, when it comes to new development, density is the only bargaining chip we really have in a lot of cases. And I agree with so many people that um, this is a great project, I think, that um, three points. It's close to transit. It's close to jobs. It's close to amenities. Um, why not 15 out of 100 of those units be for people who um, wouldn't otherwise be able to live there? And we're not talking about, you know, people in poverty. We're talking about workforce housing. Let's be real. I mean, this is teachers. This is public servants. You know, th this is not really low-income housing. Um, I think it's also to keep in mind that this is a big project. We can't do inclusionary housing with 20 unit, 30 unit projects, but this is a big project. And you can find ways with the developer, working very closely with them, to make those numbers work. I believe that. Um, so I just want to end my thoughts um, by saying that we're here. It's something to be celebrated that we as a community are now having this hard conversation. And I'm worried that we're going to get behind the eight ball if we don't start taking these opportunities very seriously as they come in front of us. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Deidreana Freeman, and I live at 1005 Wharf Street. And I actually serve on the City County Planning Advisory Board. And I unfortunately had to miss the meeting that this project came up at because I was out of town on business. I would like to take a moment and briefly just highlight the fact that I understand and appreciate the longstanding history of the Everett family here in Durham. And once, as, as many of us have said, this is not about the development itself, it's about the process. And um, just make sure I stay on time. This is, what, this is the first of many to come. And I would like to caution moving forward without some policy in place to keep housing affordable for low wage earners. Uh, that would encourage all developers to develop around transit with progress in mind, unlike the transit area plans currently um, and in other cities like Charlotte, Atlanta, and others that did not consider the drastic market affordability upshift that would occur when rail transportation was installed. It is my hope that the planning around transit makes a priority of keeping and creating housing options for low wage earners of this city all along the transit line. Moving forward without regard for the macro impact of each of these zoning and planning developments near and around transit stations could cause displacement for residents. Please consider what is best for all of Durham and the location next to transit including homes affordable to people with low material wealth, focusing now on developing policies and partnerships to allow for a 15% minimum priority of new housing developments at each station should be affordable for, for wage earners. Would you please support this small request as, a po as policymakers? There are many ways to isolate this issue and find resolutions to ensure that the Durham citizens that live and work in this city can afford to live in it. As Mel mentioned, the teachers, the teacher's assistants, the custodians, the administrative staff, the hourly employees barely making a uh, livable wage, all need some place to live. Not just now, but in the future. Consider what proximity of residents' access to public transportation to get to work can do for a budget and how beneficial transit service is for those with lower incomes. People who live and work here in the city of Durham all should be able to afford to live in Durham. After the wave of development drives the market rental rate and home ownership prices up, like in downtown or 9th Street. If you work for the city, you should be able to afford to live in the city. I want to be specific in stating that it's not so much that this development is the issue, it's that this sh there shouldn't be a piecemeal process to this. In order for us to actually have an impact, we're going to need to do this as a comprehensive plan. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> that, that concluded all the persons who had signed up to speak in opposition to this, this item. 
Uh, I don't know if the developers want to use the remaining amount of their time for any comments. Uh, I'm not going to close the public hearing yet until I've had an opportunity to hear from council members. I'd like to respond briefly to some points. First of all, I appreciate the sentiments, and I've, uh, in this process, met many smart people, advocates on all sorts of sides in talking with staff um, and uh, in talking with advocates for the issue and talking with city council members and have learned a great deal. Um, there's some, some, some quick rebuttals that I'd like to make just to clarify the issue and to give a different side. I do appreciate all the people who've even the advocates who said this is a great project, and that means a lot, and I think that's unanimous here. I guess what we're talking about, even though it's a comprehensive plan, is affordable housing. Um, but to just say what, in case someone doesn't know in the room, what they're talking about is uh, my family's had a long history of affording affordable housing, which I've mentioned before. Uh, my father, who, who came, we, we spoke about, came up with the idea of mixed use, um, actually was the founding board member of the Affordable Housing Group of North Carolina in 1966. That was a time when not many people talked about affordable housing. Um, and his work, as I pointed for the Planning Commission, was so appreciated over the 30 years that the Charlotte Housing Authority and that group named a affordable housing house in his honor with 10 housing units called the Robinson Everett House that has disabled affordable housing. It's an issue we care about greatly and I appreciate all the compliments we gave to about developers. And that's why I think an, a, a, a vote tonight is a vote for a great project and a vote for a developer that clearly is making an effort, has clearly thought about it, who's clear, made an offer that I think is the best offer for this time now when everyone says, let's come up with a plan that we're offering a proffer that really makes sense. And it's a yes to a developer that's shown that they're a local developer, that isn't going to be building something and flipping it, that isn't going to be doing about some of the things that people have expressed concerns about. The, that is here to stay and that actually cares about the same issue you're talking about and shares the same goals. So I think you're saying a double yes to both sides and it's a win-win. And that's how I feel strongly. And I do think that they talked about so many good things and I just want to be clear what we all know those are so we stay it. We're talking about jobs, potentially over a thousand jobs that could be done with the full build out of this project talking about taxes, taxes that go to things not just housing, but things like schools that we all care about. So if you vote against that, you're voting in something else. When someone says they're just for, life's complicated. Um, when they talk about things that could happen, there are a lot of different viewpoints about what would happen. I actually went to all the TTA meetings, a uh, TTA meeting at the bus station and spoke with those and have done some research. And it's not clear all the impacts of rental rates on different housings in different stations. It depends on the city. It depends on the light rail, when it's built, how the city supports it, how the city um, subsidizes it. It depends on what the station is. For instance, everyone has said here, well, we know there's an incredible abundance of affordable housing at this site. That's right. The Durham staff made their first report to show this site has 79.5% current affordable housing. The goal in the resolution is 15%. That's more than five times. 13% of which is already committed housing. So when, when you hear studies that I've been sent from friends who are experts in this industry, and they say the affordable housing has an effect, it's on certain things like potentially new construction that's built to take advantage of the transit, not old construction. When someone's talking about Poplar Manor, um, my own staff who's here to support, who does work and knows this area very well, can tell you that Poplar Manor's prices have not risen, as people have just said. Um, to get some specifics, they say, why can't we just do 15%? Well, 15% of a new build, by the way, would be an incredible ask. So I think you need to clarify the resolution, which is why we want to support and give our $25,000 to the, to the housing needs assessment plan so that Durham can understand and make the right decisions. But 15%, the reason we've explained over and over again is because it's impossible to finance in this particular location with this particular very dense, very expensive build around a parking deck with a wrap. That's why we can't. To, um, 
address some things that were said earlier, unless you want to speak. Oh, uh, well, for those reasons, to support the many things we said of, of jobs, to support tax increase, to support transit itself, which, by the way, if you don't get and you don't increase the density, you won't have this issue about affordable housing that we're talking about. We ask you again to give us your approval, and we again thank the people who came to support, and we ask you to stand again. Thank you. That concludes the public comments, both pro and uh, against this project. Thank you. Uh, the matter is now back before the council, and entertain questions by uh, comments by members of the council. Any particular order? I recognize the mayor pro tem. Um, I'd like Mr. Everett to come back. Could you explain, okay. I'm trying to just wrap my hands around what you just said. Could you explain again why 15% of this project could not be affordable housing? Is it money that you would lose or uh, make it clearer for me? Sure, I'd be, yes ma'am. Um, we would lose money. It's a, it's a, to, to do that, it's um, when you go to finance a project, you have to go to lenders, and lenders have a, a system of underwriting the project based on cash flows, investment thresholds, and without being an expert, I actually have uh, Keith Wells of Northmark Capital who's been advising, and when I ask those questions, they're very clear with me, Rob, it would be unfinanceable. A lender is going to balk because of the cost of doing it because of the difference between the construction costs, the really significant construction costs in this land around this deck and how much your, your fixed income would be, and because of the difficulty, in, in my, my mind, of license of how, what they would do if it failed, how they would foreclose upon it, what value would be get out of it. So because we couldn't go to any traditional lender and get a loan, we could not do it. So you mentioned, though, that you could not do it in this location, I thought. Did you say that? In this location? Yes. Right, this proposal. Right. This proposed so, project. Suppose you were to take it some other, where in Durham could you take this project and include that 15%? Well, here, of course, there's already 80%. So the understanding the best pres uh, the best policies, perhaps, of what you'll find, and I don't know the answer because Durham's still looking for it, and I want to be a part of that process and help. But I think the answer of where this wants to, you know, as opposed to where there's already 80% and where it's a transient population that comes and moves, would be where there's a more uh, a population that lives, is more stable, that sets roots, and has a mixed band of income. And you're talking, some of the examples were given were big multifamily income projects. Well, this is, of course, a mixed-use project with a lot of high commercial and retail use, not typical easy garden variety retail, but complicated retail around a deck with parking that has um, complicated land use rights, which is another, uh, air rights, which is another reason a bank, as I understand, would find it impossible to underwrite it. Who is the banker in the group? Sir, could you come? I'm just trying to go through this education process. My name is Keith Wells. I'm with Northmark Capital. Would you just share why you would not be able to finance um, under these circumstances? It, yeah, t and I'm, I might be repeating a couple things, but the, the high density, the, uh, the parking garage that's built, the wraparound structure, the 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 requirement or the needs to, for the density to go six to seven stories over and above add multiples on the costs. And because it's an air rights uh, and it's not a simple fee simple, meaning it's, it's a piece of land and a building on it and the security is the land and the building. But in this case, because of the high density and the parking garage and the cross easements, each of the pieces of the puzzle of the commercial, uh, of the retail, of the apartments, of the parking deck, all need 
cross easements and they have to flow in a certain way that's much, much, much more complicated than a, and I don't want to make it as simple, but as a simple fee simple structure. The high density, the cost of the project will, will most likely double because of the parking garage and the required engineering on the structure. Um, as well as just the, the workings of the different banks and permanent lenders that have to work together to finance all these pieces. So in my opinion, uh, my professional opinion of 32 years in doing commercial real estate financing, uh, it, it is very unlikely that this would get financed at all um, in the current economics of income expenses versus the total cost of the property. I have other questions, but my other question is for Larissa, and I'll, I'll get, I'll ask it later. Are there other comments by members of the council? Yep. Recognize Councilman Brown. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I want to thank everyone who came out this evening uh, and spoke. Uh, so well, so eloquently on, on both sides of this issue. Uh, I want to specifically address CAN and those of you who were here representing CAN. Uh, I start my, uh, my 12th year next month on this council and I have been to almost every can meeting and <clears throat> I have voted I think with almost every resolution that you presented to us except for one and that was the meeting a month or so ago at my wife's parish Immaculate Conception and where you attempted in my judgment to move the goalpost, to change the game, because when we voted in May of this year, it was indeed a unanimous vote for the 15% affordable housing within a half a mile of a transit stop. And what you inserted in that resolution that night was to say that all new housing must also contain 15%. And that is not, ladies and gentlemen, what this council agreed to in May. We looked at the aggregate <laughs> of housing close to the train stop and that is why, as has been pointed out tonight, this current stop has close to 80% affordable housing as it exists now. Now, some of you have said, Jim and others, that, well, who, who can determine what's going to happen 10 or 15 years from now? how much of the affordable will be affordable, even though I think, Rob, you mentioned that 13% will remain as affordable. But in some ways, you know, to be fair, that's rather specious logic. I mean, how can we look 10 or 15 years from now and say, well, you know, that's a huge X factor, so we can't determine that. So therefore, we need this with this particular project. Uh, that's not logical, in my judgment. And I know many of you will disagree on that. But again, we are talking about a specific site that already contains 75 to 80 percent affordable housing. And now many of you are here asking for this 
new construction to have the 15% as well. And Keith, I'm, I'm glad you were here because, you know, we talked about this site and we talked about the developer, but what we have left out until the last few minutes is the lender. Because this project, please take your rose colored glasses off now, this project will not happen unless the lender approves it and the underwriters. And they will not approve it now. And this has been in the mix now for going on at least a year. So I would suggest that we need to remember that the perfect, which perhaps the 15% would represent, perhaps. The perfect must not become the enemy of the good. And the good is what is represented here by this family and the overall development and what it will do for this area in a very, very positive way. Now, a second point and emails, and it's been expressed verbally this evening by some of you, that we should not give away density. Well, I guess I would suggest that you can't give away what you do not have. Many of you in this audience this evening want a transit system. Now, quite frankly, I'm not sure if that's really going to happen. But I can assure you of one thing. It will not happen. It will not happen unless we have the required density. And I must say, folks, if you're just looking at Chapel Hill and Durham, and we all know that we cannot do this without state funding and federal funding, that that will not happen unless we have the density. And even with that, it is going to be a, a real difficult task to get any monies from either the state or the feds for this project, which has now blossomed to close to $1.8 billion. $1.8 billion. And we have increased taxes for this, but that rep, and so has Orange County. Now, Wake County, thank goodness, elected four new good people to their county commission. But still, this will go before the voters, the voters in Wake County, and how long? One year, two years, three years, who knows? So I'm not one to be pessimistic. I was not elected to be pessimistic, okay? I was elected to, to try to look at on the positive, to believe in hope. But when you look at the total infrastructure needs in this state, indeed in this nation, for all of our transportation needs. Some people may come back and say, and perhaps some of you, by the way, saw the 60 Minutes program uh, two weeks ago on the crumbling infrastructure. And you know, we've heard about that now for years. And we're not doing anything about it. And some may come back and say, well, light rail, fine. Um, that, it's a nicety, but it is not a necessity. A necessity is making sure, among other things, that your bridges are functional and safe, and that your, your highways and your streets do not create more problems in terms of safety than they do now. So 
light rail, fine. Do I support it? Sure. Will it happen uh, when I'm still on this earth? And by the way, I'm a pretty young guy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But if any of you or any illusions, have any illusions about going to Raleigh and asking the members of the General Assembly to support Durham and Chapel Hill for their light rail system, mm. you need to, perhaps you, you've come from Colorado and you're smoking something else. Because <laughs> that is not going to happen, folks. Um, so these are just a few of the issues. The, the city attorney, I'm sure, and, and my good friend Steve Shaw will bring up the, uh, the issue of a mandated 15% set aside, uh, which, which to put it very succinctly, we cannot legally do, do in this state. But there are just a couple of issues I may return. Thank you so much for listening. Councilman Brown, let me ask her there. Let, let me get some water here before I make Councilman Moffitt, Councilman Cotardi, Councilman Davis, Councilman Shule in that order. I, I wonder, can I get staff up to the microphone, please? So we've heard a lot of comments, and I'm starting to get a little lost between plan amendment and rezoning. Um, can we come back to, this is a plan amendment, which, which I will make the editorial comment. This is why I wanted to combine both hearings into one at some time in the past. But let's, let's uh, see. Let's get back to the fact that this is a, a plan amendment that enlarges the compact neighborhood tier. So can you just briefly, once again, sort of bring us back to focus by saying the impacts of the plan amendment? Just tell us what they are. Sure, Councilman Moffitt. The, um, the plan amendment before you proposes to change the development tier. The development tier has changed through um, the comprehensive plan amendment process that you're um, undertaking right now, but it does have uh, some of the characteristics of zoning map change. It does authorize, through the Unified Development Ordinance, additional density, uh, and it does change the uh, site development standards, reduces buffers, allows a more uh, urban mixed use and intense f urban form than the urban tier does. So um, what th this act would do is allow um, the zoning change that will come before you next to be um, legally approved and, and implemented. So, okay, so the, it, it, it adds density, it reduces buffers, mm -hmm. but it doesn't change the underlying zoning. That's correct. Okay. Um, and does it, um, does, it, does it add any entitlements? I mean, it allows additional entitlements to be added, but does it actually, does the tier change itself add any entitlements? I would say no. I think your frame is exactly right. It allows for those to be added through, um, through subsequent zoning actions and site plans and other actions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilman Cotardi. Thank you, Mayor. Um, similarly, I have questions for the planning department. And um, I was wondering if you could explain our planned approach moving forward to transit and station area planning as a whole and the timetable for that, as well as our plans for improving affordable housing incentives. And can you also clarify whether we'll be addressing, and I'll repeat all these if you need them, both new units and maintaining existing affordable units in the area, because I think that's a very important clarification. And then lastly, if you could also talk about our plans to revise the mixed-use guidance in the UDO. Uh, if I might, uh, Councilwoman Katati, I'll take your middle two questions first, and then I'll ask Aaron Kane of our staff to come give more detail about our planned approach um, to compact area, compact neighborhood planning. Um, city staff's working very diligently since our August 20th kickoff uh, with count the county and our community partners to uh, ensure that your May 2014 resolution, the goal set in that is, uh, continues to be met. Uh, we are gonna be giving a detailed update uh, to the Joint City County Planning Commission at the January 7th, 2015 meeting on seven separate initiatives that are well underway, different stages of completion. Again, you'll get a detailed report on the 7th of January um, that all contribute towards that goal. 
Um, they kind of fall in two broad categories. One is ensuring that we have good basic data, such as a, a detailed existing conditions analysis, and looking at what we call opportunity sites, which are underutilized sites that are either held by the city or county or by community partners, institutional partners, uh, and looking at um, uh, some other basic fundamental information that will set the frame for your future decision making. And then the second box is what we call kind of incentives and tools. So we're looking at a, a detailed toolbox that will give you all a very broad set of tools for which you can either help direct uh, that we pursue further or that we dis dismiss. We're looking at um, text amendments to the Unified Development Ordinance that would refine the density bonus and, the, uh, and look at parking reductions associated with affordable housing. Um, and we uh, have also applied for, uh, through in partnership with the Triangle Transit Administration, a, a grant to do very detailed uh, ana economic analysis of what kind of value can be captured and looking in detail at value capture techniques. So that's a kind of a sneak preview in terms of where we're at on that process. Certainly, um, as has been, has been alluded to tonight, that um, per the resolution, that definitely will include uh, preservation strategies. Um, I think something that can be said fairly obviously is that uh, almost always preservation of existing units that are in standard condition, of which we have um, over, over 2,000 at the LaSalle Station area, is generally going to be much more cost effective than um, including new units. So we, we do certainly want to keep that on the table and are going to be looking, uh, we'll look at both new and preservation, but um, that will be an area of focus because um, of the per unit cost. Um, ask Aaron to come up and talk a little bit about um, next steps. If we missed any of your questions, let me know. Sure, thanks. Aaron King with the Planning Department. Yeah, a couple of things that maybe I can go into a little more detail uh, that Patrick did not. Uh, one is that we are looking at um, shall we say exporting the design district uh, per the comprehensive plan to our other compact neighborhoods at Alston Avenue and the medical center area which would include this LaSalle Street area as well as three of the suburban transit areas um, that also plan to have stations at South Square, Patterson Place and Lee Village. We're in that process now and we'll have an update for you on January 7th. Uh, we also were talking today about some of the affordable housing incentives that we'll be able, able to provide for you on January 7th. Probably not tech, UDO text yet, but a couple of uh, things that we can go ahead and move forward, such as uh, lowered parking requirements and some changes to the affordable housing density bonus, which will hopefully make it more palatable and usable to the development community. That's very helpful, thanks. Um, so one thing I was going to reference is certainly we're hearing from other neighborhoods or communities like Lee Farm um, that are asking for planning attention and action. And so I guess my question is, what is the urgency to move on this particular request uh, for the comprehensive plan change in this area now? Why wouldn't we wait and um, approach the compact neighborhoods and station area plans holistically rather than parcel as parcel uh, as that the would, developers approach us. Sure, that would certainly be an option is to um, wait for us to go through the process to def better define the compact neighborhoods now that we are more um, aware of and the more defined locations of each of the station areas. Um, so we can do a better job now of defining where those compact neighborhoods should be and employing the design district zone, compact design zoning to those areas. That's simply a, a timing issue that's probably going to be um, at least months, if not um, years away, at least for the zoning to be in place that would provide for the um, administrative rights to build what has been proposed here. Thank you. Um, jumping ahead to the zoning, I'll just say that the, the development plan doesn't provide a lot of specificity, so it's hard to tell exactly what's intended there. But um, I would favor that we wait and do this in a comprehensive fashion rather than parcel by parcel. Thank you. Thank you. Recognize Councilman Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I guess I have a couple of questions. One for the um, opponents, uh, and I'd like to ask a representative of that group to uh, talk about how long you think you'd want to wait as you have advocated and um, what kinds of negotiations or discussions would you have with the developer uh, during that interim period? And I guess the question for the proponent uh, would be the contribution of $25,000 uh, 
is that something that can be viewed positively or will some people put a negative spin on it in terms of um, um, money to just buy off the opposition? You want me to speak first? Or yeah, either way, either yeah. one. I, I s wanted to just say one thing about the 25000 It would be great if we could use some of those funds to help us resolve this um, issue that we have here tonight. And But there are free folks that we can utilize um, at the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency. They have a 80-20 tax uh, exempt bond program that's been used by uh, Bank of America and the Charlotte Housing Authority. And um, I think that uh, there are banks that do finance affordable housing and also there are lenders who finance mixed use housing which includes residential and we've had that um, in this area. I believe Golden Belt is one example. Um, so I don't know how long it would take uh, to try to include affordable housing because it's really up to the developer to offer. Okay. Do you want no, me no, to speak to anything else? That's, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Councilman Davis. Um, our team read the resolution that was adopted in May of 2014 very carefully. And that resolution calls for a process, the process of establishing a plan that will put in place the, the term used by the planning folks as a toolbox. We need to move that for process forward. And you're looking at a team with Dan Jewell, Rob Everett, and myself. We have put in thousands of hours on these transit issues over the last 15 years. And we recognize, I, I think it's fair to say, that, that um, the planning department is, is somewhat resource constrained. So as we read the resolution very carefully, we said, how can we move this process forward? The best way to do that is to contribute financially $25,000 from Mr. Everett and his family to bring in the expertise or to uh, give the planning department and the, the administration the resources they need to put together the toolbox to create incentives so that instead of having a discussion like we're having tonight, we'll have a framework so that we will know as we're going through the process what works in order to allow the project to obtain financing and to provide affordable housing at appropriate levels at, at different stations. So I hope that answered your question. Uh, yeah, we, we want to move the resolution, the language of the resolution forward. and. We racked our brains over the last couple of weeks to come up with this idea. It wasn't just something that we thought up walking into the building tonight. Um, we appreciate all the time the council has put into this issue, and uh, we hope you'll recognize the dedication of this team to this particular issue and to moving this process forward. Uh, that, Mr. Mayor, I want, want to apologize to both sides. Um, I, this was not intended to. Um, we have blunt questions, but no, they were not designed. No offense to be taken. Okay. There was absolutely no offense taken, okay. Councilmember Davis. Absolutely none. Thank you. Recognize Councilman Shul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I have. Uh, I first have a question for uh, the banker. Again, would you? Would that be all right? Thank you. Yes, sir. Is it Mr. Wells? Yes, sir. I'm sorry, I couldn't remember that. Thank you. Um, yes, sir. It's Keith Wells. Yes, sir. Um, in terms of, I mean, there are there are financial institutions that fund affordable housing and and mixed use and mixed income developments in cities around the country. Um, have, have you all? Do you all do that sort of thing? Yes, sir. I've okay. financed a lot of affordable housing uh, in excess of a hundred million dollars. Uh, right. F financed a couple hundred million dollars worth of uh, market rate apartments. Um, it, it, it gets dangerous and confusing when you say Bank of America on an 80-20 tax exempt bond deal supported by an EDA mm -hmm. on 
a garden apartment deal that was done so it could get built and then to try and transpose that into a very complicated structure, high density mixed use because it requires now an EDA to come in, it requires a bank that has certain requirements for tax-free bonds and if you follow the amount of regulations that go on who they lease to when and if it goes out of whack then the tax-free bonds lose their tax-free status and then there could be a put. So it, it's, it's much more complicated than it, 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 in a scenario where it is a mixed-use commercial, residential, hospitality, office, retail, where we're trying, from what I understand, is to increase the density for jobs, for, uh, for, for this location, for tax revenues, with the support of the housing that's there. So it, when you mix some apples and oranges together, yes, they do get done, and there are lots of very, very, very specific uh, rules and regulations on the tax credits that go, and if they default, what happens on the tax-free bonds, which are very draconian. And that's why I say, and again, there's a, there's a difference between an air rights development where it, it's, there are multiple pieces of multiple lenders on each pieces and uh, the cross easements of, of the flow of traffic in this parking garage Again, part of the high density use, which yes, this lender does do those things, but is that lender going to come to this location and do this specific property on an air rights, not a fee simple basis with cross easements and elevator buildings at, and at $125,000 a unit in cost? Well, well, now it's a different story. And, and that's the piece of the puzzle. Uh, yes, there is affordable housing that does get done. There are certain initiatives that certain major metro areas, D.C., Philadelphia, may do because they're trying to solve certain issues. Um, it, and I just, it's very dangerous to say, well, they did it in D.C., so we should be able to do it here. It, it, they're very much specifics to this property. Right. As so you have you all run any numbers with any of those affordability assumptions built in? amongst ourselves we've talked about what it means but more importantly uh, it's it's the complications of the tax credits and the tax-free financings that are used by housing agencies and uh, EDAs to get these so that they are feasible and the mixing of those with market rate lenders and banks and because this is going to have to roll off from the bank to a permanent lender, from a recourse to non-recourse, now we're bringing in life insurance companies. And if I said, could you include one affordable unit in the in the in the development? What would the answer be? The economic impact would be minimal. How about um, ten. Again, it becomes a multiplication. What happens is the number of lenders who are feasible at one most of the lenders are still in the room. At 10, half just walked out. At 20, three quarters just walked out. And, and now we start stressing an undue burden potentially on the project, can it get feasibly done? Because every lender that walks out, the price just went up. So, I mean, this is a, this is a, a fairly large project. It's millions and millions of dollars that would be invested in, from the 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 the, uh, the residential and the commercial and so forth the office and and you're saying that for ten affordable units out of uh, over two hundred that are potentially to be built the lenders would walk out of a deal like this there are, sure but it, there mm -hmm. if there's an affordability com uh, a piece of the puzzle mm -hmm. as soon as you said affordability half of them are going to walk out because there are, again, there are certain restrictions and requirements that go to a higher level. There are also time periods that go, and, and the, 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 the lady brought up earlier, which is very important, in, in most affordability properties, it goes away after 15 years. I, 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 I finance a lot of properties that have a 15-year window, and it's gone after 15 years. So the, um, 
uh, Councilman Brown talking about what's in the future five years, 10 years, 15 years it is very important because they're gonna go away anyway. The, the requirements that are the, the restrictions to affordability to use it, and this is national housing financing. This is through HUD requirements. And we state do, we do a lot of that in Durham, and we I think yes. we, we really so. understand really well about those, uh, how the uh, requirements do roll away, and we do a lot of work in Durham with taxpayer money to uh, extend those, the, the, the affordability periods. I think we've done that this year for probably a couple of hundred units that we've uh, worked with the uh, the uh, develop the uh, developer the owners to to keep those units affordable. Yeah, they're very great. For, they're for, great tools for they for, really for an increasing period of time. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, to the um, also a couple of questions for the staff. Um, we we've received. First of all, I want to say something about the staff. I just I'm really. You guys do fabulous work. Um, the you know the, the the number of questions that you all are constantly a, uh, asked under pressure and uh, from all sides. I just want to uh, express my appreciation and just thinking about that when when you were up here and, and Aaron when you called on Aaron, I saw him getting up out of his seat and I thought you know poor Aaron, he's going to be on the hot seat. Uh, but you all do a wonderful job with it and not just in in this in these settings but in the information you give us. So I really want to. Express my Thank appreciation. You, They're very. You're probably the only department in the city that's constantly under this sort of uh, questioning, and I know it's probably not the most that's fun the part of the job. <laughs> yeah. Um, how is this different from how we're approaching Lee Village? And we, we've received so many uh, emails lately from, and, and you all have as well, from Lee Village uh, people that would like to have a compact neighborhood district for Lee Village, and they have a they've they've privately. Uh, they have a private uh, plan that they have promoted, um, and so how is this different than that situation? Sure, Council Mitchell, that's a great question. I, th I think um, I'll give a little more information, uh, kind of picking up where uh, some of the information Aaron gave to Councilwoman Katati. Thinking back in 2005 when we were um, planning for and then adopting the comprehensive plan, there was only one station area uh, along the Irwin Corridor, which was at the, at the medical center. Uh, in 2010, uh, TTA identified the second station area right at the corner of LaSalle in Ir Irwin, which is immediately adjacent to this site. So I think um, we, we as staff made a distinction between um, this future LaSalle station area. The property in question before you tonight is, is certainly going to be either directly adjacent or within hundreds or thousands of feet uh, of the station area. Um, because of the certainty that we now have about the station location, we feel comfortable recommending to you, as we have did earlier, um, that, this, that this area can be designated and developed under those standards. Uh, Lee Village, Patterson Place, and uh, MLK South Square in 2005 were part of um, what was then considered a phase two, uh, very distant in time, potential alternate alignment along 54. Uh, so what we did because of that uncertainty is identify those three station areas as what we call suburban transit areas. Uh, candidly, that was kind of a hedge on the idea that we did not know where these stations were gonna be. We didn't know whether there was gonna be a southern alignment or the northern alignment. We, we now know that. And because we have that cer better certainty and much better information about the station location, we feel like it's important to go out with a more robust community engagement, more extensive process, um, in all three of those areas to make sure we understand the, the definition, the outer boundaries, um, and other characteristics of these, uh, and really just to designate them as compact neighborhood tiers, which has not occurred yet. So I think it's just the level of planning and the level of certainty we have about the development pattern, I think, is the short answer. And, um, and the, but the planning we're doing there, um, you know the 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 the, uh, the sassy process and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's. Can you talk about some of the things that are provided for in, in that kind of planning? And would that be done? Would that be done for this uh, uh, extension of this boundary? I mean, how 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 do those things interact? Well, that's a good question. I think that the sassy process is going to continue, and it's going to look at all eleven areas, and it's going to look at uh, infrastructure needs 
infrastructure, infrastructure finance possibilities and include affordable housing. We're kind of uh, using the umbrella of the SASE financial component to look at the affordable housing financing and develop that toolbox and take it to the public. Um, so we, we are going to look at that in LaSalle area and, and all the other 10 uh, station areas uh, through the SASE process. Um, I mean, it's certainly a fair point, and you all don't have to make the same, same distinction as Aaron alluded to that we have of how this site is different than Lee Village, but I think it's really just because it, it's a directly adjacent to an existing area. Really, the LaSalle and Irwin areas will be overlap substantially because of the proximity of those two plant stations. So and, we feel like could, the planning can, we did there yeah. helps, helps uh, improve our understanding of the, those area, that area. And I can see how that is true. I can see why you would make those distinctions and that makes sense. On the other hand, we are now extending the boundary without the benefit of, the, of that kind of planning. Mm -hmm. Would that be true? I mean, I think without a, a thorough process like we had in 9th Street in downtown, that would be correct, yes. Yeah, and, and, and as we are also planning then for the future station areas as well. So one of my questions I think was answered earlier, which is when we get the first look at the, the, the affordable housing toolkit on January 7th. Yes, and, sir. And then how long after that, how long is the process is it to go from that toolkit to being able to implement some of those uh, housing, affordable housing incentives? I know you can't tell exactly, but do you have any sense of what that might be? Well, I, I think it would depend on um, we would need to do, and this won't be able to occur until after the, the initial presentation, we want to give you all the broad range of concepts. We want to get some direction from Joint City County Planning Committee. And those, air, those um, tool, toolbox components that are, appear to be favored, we want to do detailed analysis on the legality and fiscal feasibility of those. And then after that analysis is complete, we'd come back with a, a full report. And we certainly intend to be near completion of that by the end of the fiscal year. By the end of the fiscal year, so, okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, and then I, I had a question also for the developer, which was, when do you anticipate, can you talk about the phasing of the build out and what you anticipate? I know, again, you don't know exactly what that will be, but I wondered if you could try to give me some sense of that. Uh, Council Member Shul, the real estate market right now is very strong, and so uh, we would be remiss if we didn't say we are, we are bullish uh, on the commercial and office opportunities at this location. Uh, we do not have any immediate plans for additional residential at this location. Uh, we, uh, we would start rolling up our sleeves and working on the financing tomorrow if this project is approved tonight. Uh, it, it's been in the hopper, it's been in the process for over a year. So, um, and the market is, is, is strong. How much longer that market lasts is uh, a very difficult prediction to make. Uh, so I'd be remiss if I didn't say that timing is something we're very, very concerned about. That's why we've moved ahead with the structured parking that I, I trust everyone on the council has seen uh, to, in order to make the development uh, move forward as quickly as possible. So if a large um, biotech company, a spinoff from Duke uh, due to technology transfer, wanted a large office space, R&D space, we'd be able to move forward quickly and meet that need. Uh, meeting the needs of tenants in the real estate market is really a 12-month window. If you say you're, it's going to take you longer than that to deliver their space, they're going to look somewhere else. Um, so I, I hope that answered your question. We have good, strong indicators that and commercial and office to, will move to, I'm forward sorry, soon. Well, that commercial and office can move forward in the near future. Yeah. And then when you think about the residential, and, and I heard you say you, you don't have any immediate plans for That's it, right. and, and uh, I suppose it's a possibility that if that there were other uh, uses there. There might never be residential there if the market was. That's an interesting question, Council Member Shule. You know, we've approved so much multifamily in Durham that I, I have seen it taper off. I'm not aware mm -hmm. of a whole lot of multifamily coming through the pipeline now relative to what we saw um, over the last two or three years. So it, it appears to me that, yeah. that the cycle is, is going down. Yeah. When it will pick up again, I, I really don't know. Yeah. And then, so the, does the is there any match in the timing of the arrival of the uh, the toolbox in, um, let's say, the end of the fiscal year? So you know, let's just say next July or August. And when you 
might really need to know about your residential? Um. I'm, 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 I'm trying to get at this idea. You all are, have shown a lot of interest in affordable housing, and, and I believe that that is sincere. And, and yet, uh, you haven't proffered any, and I, I won't, I'm going to get to the $25,000 in a minute because I think it's a very, you know, it's, it's great. But the, we're, we've got a toolbox that we think we'll have, will be ready for, and, and that this, hopefully, this 25000 will contribute to. Uh, and then that would be available, which would provide various incentives that might help the financing that this gentleman was discussing earlier. Um, in time for you all to build your residential, at least the way I understand it, you're not really looking to build that residential soon. And I was wondering if there was a, a match there or uh, if there was uh, anything that could be worked out along those lines. To follow up on what the planning department shared with us about preservation uh, being an important part of the tool toolbox, um, we think it would be fair for the developer to agree that the existing affordable housing on site, which is popular manner, uh, we will agree to not redevelop that for at least 12 months, which would give, if I understand the planning department correctly, plenty of time for the toolbox to be put in place. And so we would. Uh, we can commit to maintaining the existing affordable housing on site throughout the duration of the time that it takes the administration to, to bring forward the, uh, the incentives that we've been discussing tonight. If that addresses your concern, I hope it does. It, it's, it, it helps. We hope it and does. And would you, would you then also, uh, how would you feel about, and I, Patrick's going to tell me about my wording in a minute, but how would you feel about um, then uh, working with our with that uh, the poplar manor uh, as potential uh, uh, longer term affordable housing working with the toolkit that the city has developed we'll certainly evaluate it and and we're all committed to being part of this process over the next 12 months in terms of working with the planning department on that exact issue so was that a proffer no sir Okay. No, it was a commitment to, I huh, shouldn't use that word. It was uh, our understanding that we will be at the table. It has been difficult, my understanding is it's been difficult for the planning department to identify uh, members of the private sector, the development community, uh, to participate in this process. Um, however, we're committed to doing that. And so I think we can come up with uh, a good set of incentives if we have the, the resources and the uh, willingness to do so. And I'm sorry, I misspoke. Was the first, was the, was, or were you proffering yes. to keep yes, popular, you, not to redevelop yeah, for Poplar Manor for a year? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, we could agree to not redevelop Poplar Manor until, at least until December 1, 2015. Okay. Okay, um, thank you. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, I apologize for taking so much time. Um, I think that, you know, there, to me there's a lot to like about this development. Uh, the density is, is very important. Um, and uh, I do, Gene, I, I do anticipate one day pushing you in a wheelchair on the first train to Raleigh. Uh, <laughs> I'll be on crutches. Um, and, you know, we, we, it, it's important that we have a very highly respected uh, uh, developer, uh, a, uh, you know, a son of Durham who's developing this, and, and I think that that's, there's a lot to that. Um, I also want to say that I think that the $25,000 uh, proffer is um, for the, to help us uh, develop the housing toolkit is, is great, because I do think what we have going now is, is underfunded, and I think that would help us. Um, I want to take on just a couple of the arguments. The, the idea that rents might not rise in this area uh, in the, with, with the advent of transit, and I appreciated you all providing me with some information, which I uh, read and with interest. Um, I, 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 I would say that it's my sense, and I 
could be wrong, that this is an area where I mean, we are, we're already seeing rents rising, uh, and um, I think we're going to continue to see rents go up there. Um, and so I still think that, that, you know, how can we preserve the affordable housing we have? Um, and that means requiring commitments or obtaining commitments of affordability over time. Because I think left to the market over time, we're going to lose affordability. Um, I, do, I am concerned about moving the compact tier boundary in uh, piecemeal fashion. I think that we're, we're studying it everywhere else. We're making a lots of, lots of, we're making a huge commitment to study the, the, uh, the station area strategic infrastructure. Uh, and here we are, we're not. Um, we're studying the development of compact neighborhood districts along the entire proposed rail line. And at the same time, we're coming up with the affordable housing toolbox. I also think a strength is the walkability, and that was mentioned earlier, that, that uh, people that live in these areas will be able to live in this development will be able to walk to the medical center. And I think the, the key there is that will we continue to have, as we have now, people who are nurses, who are clerks, who are data entry folks, who are orderlies being able to walk. And I think that that is also really key. I, I'm appreciative of the developer's constraints and, again, appreciated the discussion I was able to have with you all. Uh, the, I, I, d I do believe that there are significant constraints to developing affordable housing here, I have no doubt, and that there are difficulties that would have to be overcome. Um, I want to say just to to the advocates of affordable housing, just so it's clear, we cannot, have, we cannot require inclusionary zoning and we cannot require anything that is rent control. It's against the law. Um, what we can do is uh, we can uh, incentivize it and we can work with developers to make it happen and we can use the public benefits that we do confer in order to work with the developers, the private developers who want those benefits to provide affordable housing. But we can't just require it, so it's really important to know that. The, to the developers, I want to say, taxpayers cannot subsidize our way to uh, the affordable housing that we need in Durham. We, we do it a lot already. We're, we've, we're spending millions and millions of our federal and local dollars in Southside to, to uh, subsidize affordable housing. Federal government, one out of every 20 people in Durham, one out of every 20, lives under the care in some sense of the Durham Housing Authority, either through Section 8 vouchers or through living in one of our housing communities. So 5% of our folks, and this is taxpayer subsidized. But the, the to, in order to keep our housing affordable, we're going to need the cooperation of developers. We're going to need developers to come to the table, as they have in many other communities, especially around transit. This is not unusual. This is not something that only occurs rarely. It occurs all the time. We've got to have private sector participation um, if we're going to have the affordability that we need. So. Um, Here's, my, here's what I would like to offer, uh, Mr. Mayor, is that we um, keep this hearing open, uh, that we defer it, and, and ask the developer to take another shot at this, uh, to come back with us when the developer's ready with ideas on how he can achieve some level or, ma or maintain some level of affordable housing. So what I would say is this, the, the commitment on the popular matter is is a tremendous, I think, a tremendous step and significant. Um, uh, can he extend that commitment in time? Uh, can he make a, uh, can he uh, proffer that he will work with our, um, with the toolkit that we are providing in order to make that work? Um, and uh, that's what I would like to see, Mr. Mayor. My final comment is this. The, 
it, it, we have a developer here who is very civic minded. We don't always have that. I mean, we see what people are throwing up in this town and, uh, you know, calling them good developments. And we have here a developer that we know that is very trustworthy and is going to do something good. And so what I would ask the developer to do is, uh, you know, put the cap on that. Uh, figure out a way to, in, in Poplar Manor would be a fabulous way to do it, uh, to add something to what you've, you've, you've offered already. Uh, come back to us in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a month or any short period of time that you would like and uh, push this idea using Poplar Manor uh, farther uh, or come up with some other way to provide some commitment to affordable housing. Um, so the, my two concerns then are the affordable housing as well as the as how we're uh, handling the compact neighborhood tier uh, and I appreciate your time Mr. Mayor again I'm sorry it took so long but I had a lot of, a lot I wanted to think about. Well I want to try to be brief as possible. And I'm going to preface my remarks by saying there's no one on this council that has been an advocate for affordable housing as long as I have. I've been here longer than anyone on this council. And we've made a lot of progress in the issue of affordable housing. Uh, we've dedicated one cent of the property tax towards affordable housing. Uh, we've demonstrated what we can do over in Northeast Central Durham with Eastway Village with what's happening in Rolling Hills, South Point, South Side housing. So I, I just cut a ribbon, a part of a ribbon cutting last week for Sedgeville Apartments, where the city put in over $500,000 for veterans. So I don't want anyone to leave this room thinking that, at least for me, that I don't have an interest or care for affordable housing in this community. Now let's talk about TTA. I've been on TTA's board since it was in existence. I'm not chair of TTA's board. I understand the relationship between what TTA is trying to do and the whole issue about affordable housing. And there's no one been any strong on that board in terms of trying to see how we can fit affordable housing around our transit stops. So I understand TTA's requirements. I understand what they're up against. I understand Gene's concern about finance, and we have that concern also. But I understand TTA well as it relates to affordable housing. We are here this evening on this particular issue primarily because of a resolution that this council adopted unanimously. I didn't go to CAN's uh, uh, housing uh, program because I was out of town, so I, I, I wasn't aware of what, what they did. But I know the resolution that this council adopted. And what's driving us here now is because we're looking at a transit stop. We're looking at a transit stop. And somehow we're trying to fit in that resolution with the transit stop and the development. Now, I'm going to ask the staff to tell me how many affordable units are in the one half mile of this transit stop. Affordable, you can, I've heard the percentage of 75%, 85%. How many units are there? Uh, Mr. Mayor, it's approximately 2030 as of 2012, which was the most recent year. For 2030. Data, 2030. Okay. So even if this development put all 200 apartments, they didn't even say they're going to do apartments in the first place. You, you've heard them say their issue initially is commercial development. So we don't know if they're going to put affordable housing in. And we don't know if they're going to put residents in there or not. But if, if we gave them the benefit of saying they're going to put 200 in there, and we talk about 15% of the 200, that's 30 units on top of 230. I think what we're forgetting is what this council has also done relative to affordable housing and subsidized housing is where we want to place it. And what we said is we don't want to place subsidized housing in areas where there's more subsidized housing. We said that. So to me, we've got a perfect example where you've got 75% of affordable housing already in existence within one half mile of a proposed, and I say proposed, transit stop. So why not put more market rate housing, if we're going to do that, in this particular development? So he puts 15% of 200, he puts 30 houses in there. What does that do? What I'm concerned about is we have a developer, everybody's praised them for what they've done in this community, how reliable they are how long they've been doing. They started this process before we adopted the resolution. 
And it's about money. We can talk about toolboxes all we want, but the incentives are going to come down to money. That's what it's going to translate into. I've never been supportive of our toolbox right now, because I've never thought that you know, this bonus density was going to work. I've said that over and over again. You know, if this council is serious about affordable housing, you know, we should make it a priority for the staff to get on and develop this incentive box. We've been talking about that since I've been here. And now suddenly you know, it seems to be a priority, but still we don't have the resources put on there. I haven't seen anybody direct them to have it done by a certain amount of time. But we, we're going to hold up this development because of that. And I, I have a problem with that. I really do. Because I don't think it accomplishes what we want to accomplish. Because we've already got what we, we've already, we already, we, we, we're meeting the resolution many times over. A half mile of a transit station, 75% of the housing is affordable. What, what more do, are we going to ask for? <laughs> and we don't know if they're going to put residents in there. They've said they're going to put commercial developments in there. We don't know when the residents are going to come in there. But we're going to stop them because of that? I, I, I really have a problem with that. I really do. So I, I can't support delaying this any longer for all the reasons I cited. They made a proffer on popular apartments. I lived in popular apartments when I first came to Durham. <laughs> I lived there. Okay. You know, we sublet the places. So I know, I know what the development's about. They made a proffer that they aren't going to do anything else to that. How many units is, is in popular apartments? 72, I believe. 72 units out of 230, out of 2,030 units in the whole area. So they, they made a profit. They aren't going to do anything else to popular apartments for another 12 months. Make it 18 months. I don't know what you want to do. <laughs> because I don't know if the toolbox is going to be ready in 12 months. I don't know if it's going to be ready in 18 months. But if they're willing to proffer that they aren't going to touch popular apartments in terms of doing anything to it for another 12 to 18 months, if the toolbox is ready, then they can use the toolbox to go ahead and add, keep the, keep the affordability there, and maybe do it for other things. So I, I really think we're stretching ourselves. I think we picked the wrong project to try to test our resolution on because it's already there. <laughs> it's already there. I think we picked the wrong developer to push it on. You, everybody has talked about you know, what they've done, what they've demonstrated. They're a strong member of the community. The man said his father was you know, given an award for affordable housing. So what else do we need? They aren't outside developers. They're somebody we know. They're talking about putting 1,000 jobs, possibly, with this project if it goes forward. Why, why, why do we want to stop them at this point in time? I think we need to push our staff to get that toolbox or incentive box in place as fast as possible. If they're going to give us $25,000 to help with that, I think we want to use it and move on. So I, I'm, I'm not in support of stopping the project. I'm not in support of keeping the public hearing open. But again, it's up to this board to decide what they want to do. I'm going to call on one last person, the Mayor Pro Tem. She had raised her hand. Oh, that's OK. OK. That's okay. So, so I, I'm going to close the public hearing now. And the matter's back before the board to take some kind of step on where we are. I didn't entertain a motion on the item that's before us. Move the item. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Uh, further discussion on item? If not, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? I tell you, man, Close the vote. It passes, excuse me, it passes five to two with Council Member Katati voting no and Council Member Shaw voting no. Let's move to the next item, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of Council, Pat Young again with the Planning Department. Uh, this is a companion zoning case, C13-00031, uh, for the plan amendment case you just considered. Uh, it's a request to change a portion of the site considered in the plan amendment, uh, 9.86 acres, located at the northwestern corner of Irwin Road and LaSalle Street, uh, for mixed use with the development plan uh, to mixed use with the development plan under the compact uh, neighborhood tier standards. Uh, if approved, this zoning map change would allow up to 322 uh, residential units, 268,000 square feet of office space, 45,000 square feet of public or civic uses, and approximately 193,000 square feet of commercial uses. Uh, please note that these totals are cumulative. 
Uh, there is existing 104 residential units at this site and approximately 180,000 square feet of uh, commercial and office space at the site. Uh, staff determines this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan which designates the site um, based on your previous action as commercial and compact neighborhood tier. Um, the uh, request includes a development plan, includes numerous text, graphic, and uh, design commitments which are detailed uh, in Appendix D of your staff report, Table D4. Uh, staff determines this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other adopted policies and ordinances and uh, Planning Commission recommended approval at their October meeting by a vote of 10 to 0. I'll be happy to take any questions. Again, this is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. I would ask are there comments or questions by members of the council. If not, I'm going to call the names of the persons that have signed up to speak on this item. Uh, these are people who are opposed, I guess, uh, Reba Higgs. Selena Mack, Vicki Ryder, Mel Norton, Ms. Freeman. Uh, the proponents are Patrick Biker, Judith Wagner, and am I missing anyone? Did I miss anyone who has? If not, uh, let's take three, four, seven. Let's take 15 minutes on this. Each. Plan you to state your name and yes. address, please. Mayor Bell, Mayor Pro Tem, Cole McFadden, members of the City Council. My name is Patrick Biker. I live at 2614 Stewart Drive. I'm an attorney with Morningstar Law Group in Durham. Along with our team that was introduced earlier this evening, I'm here tonight representing Irwin Terrace LLC for this zoning map change. We believe there are three compelling reasons to approve the zoning map change for approximately 10 acres that's before you tonight. First, approval of this mixed-use zoning district application is the best way to implement the comprehensive plan amendment that was just approved to expand the compact neighborhood tier. Many provisions in Durham's comprehensive plan and unified development ordinance encourage pedestrian-oriented and transit-oriented development. Visual and anecdotal evidence suggests that this section of Durham has provided people there with a lifestyle opportunity where they can walk or use transit to get to work. Accordingly, it is not necessary for a two-person household to be of necessity a two-car household in this part of Durham. The second reason is that the redevelopment of Irwin Road has not only been a success for Durham from a planning perspective, but also from an economic development perspective. For example, the Trinity Commons development just one block away from Irwin Terrace generates over $800,000 a year in property taxes from just four acres. Even greater than that is the Hawk Plaza Complex, another four-acre site that generates one and a quarter million dollars annually in property tax revenue for the City of Durham and Durham County. These tax revenue numbers represent great stewardship of our land in Durham since we are far more land constrained than most other counties. The increase in property taxes I've just described resulting from the rede redevelopment of Irwin Road is a significant achievement that I don't think many people have fully recognized and it is something that we as a community should be very thankful for. The third reason to approve this zoning map change is to continue the positive momentum Durham has gained from the redevelopment of Irwin Road. We feel confident in saying that based on the successful redevelopment of the Irwin Road corridor over the past 10 to 15 years and the interest in the current market, and I'm sorry, and the interest we have seen based on current market conditions. That success is based on successful mixed-use projects such as Trinity Commons, Lakeview, Hawk Plaza, and Irwin Terrace. The next phase of Irwin Terrace could bring further commercial and office development to this section of Irwin Road, giving Durham an area that competes well for economic development with mixed-use projects in our peer cities. As our Mayor Pro Tem often says, and we agree, great things are happening in Durham. We like to think that the next great thing will be the next phase of Irwin Terrace. And so for all those reasons, our team respectfully asks for your approval. We appreciate the opportunity to present on this outstanding project to the council tonight. Thank you very much for your time. Judith, is it Wegner? Mr. Mayor, members of the council, my name is Judith Welch Wegner. I live at 2307 Pickard Mountain Road in Hillsboro. I'm one of the trustees for the Catherine R. Everett uh, Charitable Trust, which is one of the beneficiaries as this project is developed. 
I'm also a former dean, uh, law professor at UNC who teaches property law, land use, and state and local government law. So I have students, I send them over here every semester to observe your processes, and now I can tell them I was here as well. Uh, I wanted to tell you too, you need a joke this late in the evening. I would have had at least a thousand, except they're taking exams or falling asleep right now between Duke and UNC. In any event, I want to thank you for your careful consideration and want you to be aware that in this situation with this charitable trust uh, that was also benefited by Robinson Everett, there's an impact to delay, there really is, because the financing could get further complicated, uh, as was said here. It's really, also, it's not cost neutral. Uh, the cost of people working on this and the risk in the marketplace is really real. So I wanted to say first to you, you're weighing very wisely the concerns for the community, but please bear in mind that there's an additional public interest here, namely the students who will get scholarships as a result and things of that sort. The second thing I wanted to share with you, I uh, don't want to second guess your fine attorney here, but as I was hearing the earlier conversation, I was making a list of what I would be worried about on the legal front if I were sitting there with you. I actually had served on the Carborough Town Board and on the Orange County Planning Commission, so these are not new questions to me. I would agree with those, at least two of you, who said North Carolina does not permit mandated inclusionary zoning nor, in, in my opinion, uh, affordable housing. I think there's other issues here that if you ask too many exactions from an individual developer that are not closely related to the impacts of that very development, that can constitute an unconstitutional action for which you may have liability. In addition, the state statutes are limiting on when moratoria can be created, so if in effect you hold things off to get to the toolbox or to get to another day at another time, you really, not only as a practical matter, may be affecting this development, but in addition, you may be facing some important liability issues. Uh, again, I don't speak for your fine attorney, but I just thought since I was here, I should tell you that because I try to teach my students as much. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Mayor Bell, I apologize. I forgot to put in the two committed elements that we discussed on the record, if I may have just a few seconds. One additional committed element will be to assist with affordable housing issues. The developer will contribute $25,000 to the City of Durham administration within 45 days of the approval of this zoning map change. And the second additional committed element will be the developer agrees not to submit a site plan for the redevelopment of Poplar Manor for at least 18 months from the date of approval of this zoning map change. We'll be happy to email that to the planning director in the morning. Thank you, sir. Recognize Councilman Shul. Uh, Ms. Uh, Dean Wagner, I just want you to know that our city attorney is not a potted plant. Uh, the advice that he, that you talked about, he has given us, in fact, he gave it to me today, about an hour before this uh, public hearing. And so um, I just wanted to, to say that just uh, so you'd know. Um, we don't always do his bidding, um, but I can tell you that uh, he said exactly what you did. Thank you. I'd like to call in persons. Um, Ms. Freeman, is she present? Um, Mel Norton. Vicki Ryder. Selena Mack. Reba Higgs, Larissa Seibel. I'm present. I would like to uh, correct a couple of things that were discussed at the uh, plan amendment discussion. Uh, the affordable housing that is at in the half mile transit area is only the public housing at Maureen Road and Damar Court, which make up uh, less than 11% of the total housing. The other housing is market rate housing. And this uh, rezoning actually does have a negative impact on the community in that it decreases the percent of affordable housing, either way you measure it. So I respectfully urge all of our city council members to wait 
and work with this developer to come up with a, a, a proposal that will address the needs that are in our community for affordable housing as well as uh, the other any other issues that uh, may arise in this development that will have a negative impact on our community. And finally, I, I do think that it is extremely important for us to quickly move forward with uh, incentives for developers. I understand it costs money to develop affordable housing, and that's why the city has invested so much in affordable housing. But there is no way we can uh, assist with the 35,000 affordable homes or the um, even the 2,500 affordable homes needed by veterans. So as we move forward, I hope that we will have the toolbox in place very quickly uh, so we can move forward on this development and all the future developments that we are going to see um, around the transit areas. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, Jim Svara, is it going? Yes, sir. Jim? Jim, did you want to speak? Um, that's all the persons that are asked to speak on that item. I, I don't normally try to rebut something someone says, but since it's been said on the public record, I want the staff to come back up and tell us how many affordable housing units are in this, within this half mile radius. So Mr. Mayor, uh, Ms. Leibel's representation is correct. There's approximately 2,030 units uh, that are affordable to folks at 60% of area median income. Of that, of that number, uh, 391 or approximately 11 percent are subsidized, meaning they're contractually obligated to remain affordable under the control of DHA or, or partner management entity. So we did, per the resolution, include market rate affordable units, of which there are many, approximately 1,600. And the resolution specifically spoke about affordable housing at the 60 percent uh, unit. I mean, so I, I don't want anybody to walk away to say we're decreasing, if we approve this development, we're decreasing the number of affordable houses, especially when we don't know if the developer's going to put anything in there. And even if it does, even if he puts 200 in there, <laughs> you're still going to be well above the 15 percent within a half mile area. So, I mean, I, I, like I said, I don't normally rebut people, but I, I don't want anyone to walk away to say even if the developer puts 200 units up there, we're, we're decreasing the number of affordable units. We may be, but the resolution spoke to at least 15 percent. And we're almost at 80% now. So even if you put 200 in there, you're still going to have 60% at least affordable units in that one half mile area. I just think we picked the wrong project to map against our resolution. That's, that's all. It's not that we don't want to see our resolution done. I just think we picked the wrong project at this point in time to use it against. I recognize Councilman Moffitt. Thank you. Uh, I want to, um, first of all, I didn't realize a lot of people were going to leave. A, a lot of the stuff that was going on before was about the rezoning, and I was holding off until now. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the rezoning and repeat a couple things I said at that work session. First of all, I really appreciate everyone who has been here tonight, the passion and interest on both sides of this issue. I find it a, very complex, as I told the applicant today, maybe a good thing, maybe a bad thing, but the most interesting case that we've had in a long time. Um, I will say, I want to repeat what I said at the work session, which is that affordable today is not affordable tomorrow if it's not protected. And uh, certainly when I voted for the resolution, I'm, I'm, I love having affordable housing today, but I was thinking into the future um, that I want affordable housing when the trains start running, and I want them for years after that. And so when we start counting up units today, it's, it's, I'm not interested in a photograph, a point in time count. I'm interested in a long-term perspective and, and more of a movie, if you will. And the way we do that is the same as we do with environmental properties, which is if it's not permanently protected, it's sooner or later it's going to get redeveloped. And uh, in the course of it, in the in the case of environmental properties, it's a conservation easement. Um, there are other vehicles in affordable housing, but absent those vehicles, it's market rate. And um, it may be cheap market rate, but it's market rate. Um, I 
I'll, I want to uh, uh, appreciate Mr. Biker and Mr. Everett and through Mr. Biker, Mr. Jewell for um, committing to work with our staff uh, to help develop the toolbox uh, in a way that's feasible and workable. Um, we have a great staff. I want to repeat what, um, what my colleagues said about the staff. I have the utmost respect for them, but getting the real world uh, perspective and experience, real world, that's not the right way to say it, the uh, business perspective and experience, um, I think will be invaluable to help them do that. So thank you. Um, I also appreciate the commitment to helping fund uh, the work and, um, and for uh, the commitment on uh, not redeveloping Poplar Manor for some period of time. Um, when I look at this, I weigh out the public good, in my opinion. Um, and on the one hand, uh, we've, we've heard talk about jobs. We know that density is important to um, the application for rail. And of course, the tax base is always important. It's important um, for every tax paying citizen of Durham. Um, and whether, whether they're paying their taxes directly or indirectly through their rents. On the other hand, I do look at affordable housing. I think that's an important issue. And I also look at an orderly planning process for these um, transit areas. And uh, that's just what I'm weighing out in my mind. Those are the issues that I see before us tonight and um, what I'm considering. Thank you. you know, other, other comments? If not, I'm declared the public can be closed. As a matter of fact, for the council on this item, entertain a motion on item. Uh, a discussion. Recognize Councilwoman Katani. Yeah, I believe the staff report notes that there are 46 additional students that are um, possible under this rezoning, and we usually um, ask whether the applicant's willing to support um, um, support to our school system. Councilmember Katati, thank you for that question. Um, uh, to continue in the spirit that the discussions carried tonight, uh, our development, our developer will commit to uh, $500 per student uh, to, be to be paid to the Durham Public Schools uh, prior to the approval for any site plan uh, containing additional residential units. I believe that comes to $23,000, although math and lawyers are a dangerous combination. And again, we'll email that to the planning director in the morning. Other discussion? If not, questions have been called. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close, close the vote. It passes 7 0. Thank you. Let's move to item 19 zoning map change, Grandale, Grandin Trace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Pat Young again with the planning department. Uh, KC 13-00035 Grand and Trace is a request to change the zoning map designation of uh, 20.05 acres located between Herndon Road and Grandale Drive uh, south of Barbie Road from uh, rural residential to rural residential with a development plan and planned development residential or PDR 3.322. Uh, and the applicant uh, is committing to a maximum of 54 single family residential units with this uh, proposal. Uh, this request is consistent with the future land use map with a comprehensive plan which identifies uh, the property as low density residential which is uh, four units, dwelling units per acre or less and this is just over three uh, units per acre. There is an accompanying development plan with this request uh, which has text, graphic and design commitments uh, and those are detailed in Appendix D, Table D5 of your staff report. Um, there was an error in your staff report that I want to correct on the record. Uh, section G of the staff report uh, entitled infrastructure alludes to a um, previous development uh, that had provided a roadway improvement proffer uh, at this location. The staff report incorrectly identifies a right turn lane on Barbie Road onto Grandale. I think as all of you know, there's no segment of Grandale North of Barbie. So the correct um, citation uh, and the correct commitment is the right northbound right turn lane on Grandale onto Barbie Road, turning right onto Bar Barbie Road with adequate storage and taper. So I wanted to clarify that for the record and apologize for the air. Um, planning uh, staff determines this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other adopted uh, policies and ordinances and the 
Planning Commission recommended approval at the October meeting by a vote of 10 to 0. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Again, this is a public hearing. Uh, the public hearing is open. I would ask other questions. Recognize Councilman Moffitt. Yes, um, I didn't. I wasn't quite sure from reading the report. I saw that the applicant had proffered um, paved bicycle lanes uh, for staff. They did proffered um, paved bicycle lanes where they were doing other improvements. Did um, were they? Are they providing easement for the additional bicycle lanes, uh, you know, for the, the, the area in between for future paving? Or is that like, I mean, is, is there a future bicycle lane possible? I I'll, think you follow my question. I'll let Mr. Judge address that question. Yeah. Uh, Bill Judge, Transportation, yes, the applicant is dedicating enough right away that the bicycle lanes can be constructed for the full frontage. They just only proffered the construction for a portion of that frontage. Okay, are there other questions or comments? If not, we have um, Bill Ripley, Tony Tate. As proponents, and I have George Bryan. So let's, let's say 10 minutes, I guess. If, if you could state your name and address, please. Mr. Mayor, members of council, good evening. My name is Tony Tate. I'm a landscape architect and land planner. I'm here tonight representing uh, region's development um, for this case. The location of this property is near the intersections of Grandale, Herndon, and Barbie Roads. And um, early on in this process, we, we held a neighborhood meeting and you know, we presented the project, uh, answered questions to the neighbors that were there. They were um, don't know exactly there were at least 30 people from the community there um, spoke of their uh, concerns um, several of them came back and followed up with additional meetings and so um, we feel like we've uh, addressed all of the currents except for um, one that I think mr. Bryan is going to speak to tonight just an overview on the development it's approximately 20 acres in size we are requesting a, a PDR 3.322 with this case um, there was a, a section of Amanda Road which was a dirt road that kind of cut across the northern portions of this and it was um, substandard intersections distances angles and everything so we um, had that portion or Amanda Road was closed in that area to um, help facilitate this project um, we are uh, proposing a maximum of, of 53 units, all single family uh, detached units. Um, our entrance is directly across from Huntsman Drive along Grandale, and we, as staff re, uh, reported, we've uh, the plan meets all the adopted plans and fulfills all the requirements of the UDO. And so we respectfully ask that you uh, consider this case and and um, grant approval tonight. I'm here to answer any questions, uh, so I'd be happy to entertain those. Thank you. Uh, could, could, you could you speak to the, uh, maybe staff can speak to the uh, tree recovery piece or tree coverage on, on this property. I know you have a line of trees on, along Grand Elm Drive. But is it planning to keep those there or move them or what? Along Grandale, they, I don't believe the ones along Grandale are part of the proposed tree save areas currently. Well, uh, can, can someone speak to that from the staff, if you don't mind? Steve, or? So, Mr. Mayor, you're referring to the, uh, the buffer along Grandale? Okay. All right, you, there, there's a tree, he called it a buffer, along Grandale. From Huntsman down to, uh, I guess uh, Amanda, whatever that road is. I'm just trying to. I'm trying to understand. Are those trees going to be removed? Or are they going to be saved or what? Sure. Give me just one moment to get a copy okay. of the development plan. Mayor. Sure. If if I can All right. speak, I can ex answer that question. All I think. All right. Thank you. Just state your name again yes. for the record. Uh, Bill Ripley, 5011 right. South Park Drive in Durham. Mayor. Fellow members of the council, appreciate your time tonight. Uh, 
in follow up to your question, the in, I know you're very familiar with the, the location in the property. There is a group of uh, pine trees that are along Grandale uh, for most of the frontage. Our tree save areas are internal to the project uh, near Lakehurst Point where there is a stream buffer and also on the north side of the project. There is no tree, tree save or in, uh, preservation in the area you're speaking of. However, there will be required what's called a double fringe buffer that uh, we will have to do some screening and landscaping from the backyards to the street. So you're going to remove the trees, is that what you're telling me? Yes, sir. And replace them with what? There will be, the ordinance requires what double frontage uh, lots to have a screening. Uh, it will, we haven't designed it, we'll be designed at site planning. We will replant bushes and trees. Uh, it possibly could be also a berm, depending on how much topsoil is on the site. I'll, I'll ask you about that a little bit later. Uh, okay. Do you have any other comments you want to make on this since you heard signed up to speak? Uh, yes, I wanted to go ahead and uh, uh, save Council Member Katati's uh, voice. I'll, uh, I know there's some concern. The only concern I'm aware of uh, is uh, George Brown's uh, concern about traffic, and I'll let him discuss that as, as his, and then I'll be glad to speak to that and answer questions and answer any additional questions the council has. Thank, Thank you. you. I recognize uh, George Brown. Good evening, Mayor Bell and council members. My name is George Bryan, and I reside at 6505 Hunter's Lane in Durham. And before I get to my remarks, I just want to thank Council for all their work because I know it's been a long evening. It had been my hope that in connection with the proposed development that we could get a badly needed left turn lane on Grandale Drive at Barbie Road. Indeed, the developer was willing to work with us on this matter. However, it now appears that our efforts toward this end were in vain. This being the case, my hope is that Council can find a way to get that left turn lane constructed. Otherwise, I am concerned that we will see an increasing amount of traffic on Huntsman Drive as impatient drivers cut through our neighborhood in search of alternative routes to their destinations. Thank you for your consideration to these comments. Thank you. Staff, have any, any comments more on that item? Can, can someone tell me what, what are the plans for the roundabout at Herndon and Barbie Road? Can anyone speak to that? Wesley Perham City's Transportation Department. Uh, the State Department of Transportation is still uh, proceeding with the development of the project, relocating utilities, and uh, we'll be moving forward with construction, I believe, sometime next year. So that is a commitment by the NCDOT. And what impact will that have on traffic in terms of the Barber Road and Herndon as far as this particular development? Well, I don't expect it would have any benefit to this particular intersection, but obviously we'll make improvements at the uh, Herndon and Barbie intersection to provide better traffic control and uh, addressing uh, safety concerns there and ingress, egress movements at that intersection, but not the one at Grandel and Barbie. And the question has been raised by uh, George Bryan in terms of swapping. What, what was the reaction to that? Um, the request that was made um, to us earlier um, by the applicant was uh, they basically asked if we would lobby NCDOT on their behalf for NCDOT to lower their design standard, which would be which is to require turn lane into the development in lieu of an off-site improvement. And we advised that that wouldn't be an appropriate role for staff to take on a technical matter of that sort, that we clearly understand that it is NCDOT's policy to require turn lanes into new subdivisions on roads that carry the volume of traffic that currently exists on Hernan Road. We are certainly supportive of both improvements 
and see that there is certainly a need for both. And what about the, t the turn lane on? Well, as I said, we would agree that the turn lane at both locations would be appropriate. But uh, the, the turn lane at Grandel uh, is an off-site improvement since this particular development did not rise to the level of triggering or requiring a traffic impact analysis, we didn't see that there was a technical basis within the ordinance to require the off-site improvement at Grandel. Yes, we'd certainly agree that there's no doubt that there's a need for the improvement, and that's been identified in previous studies, including the uh, traffic impact analysis done for the 751 South development. Bill, you have any comments on that? <coughs> I'm not in disagreement with uh, your driving and Mr. Bryan's driving that area and neighborhood. I know you go through that intersection, so, you, so I don't have the personal experience of driving through and seeing the delay in the more. I, I, I assume it's an AM left turn lane delay is the biggest delay. Um, the street itself is, is at 46 percent capacity, so Grandel Drive itself is uh, serving its needs. That intersection or proposed improvement is, uh, as I think Pat Young mentioned early, is a committed element on 751 South to make that improvement. So I can't, I don't know if that project is something that will be added in a, their first two years or five years down the road of when they get to that improvement. All I understand is from several staff members of the city that they have been meeting with uh, different folks to get some plans together. So I assume they will be, <coughs> excuse me, submitting a plan to start their 751 South, um, but I don't have a schedule. I'm not tied into their development plans. Well, none of us, you can't do it. The size of this 20 acre project and 50 plus or minus houses is, is really, it's an economic burden. Um, a traffic improvement of that nature is probably, um, our estimation is a $150,000 cost. Okay. Um, I had volunteered if it made more logical sense to put it at Grand on Barbie Road and it was more useful, I'd be glad to do that in exchange for offset of not doing the one at Huntsman Drive, which is maybe not needed as much. Uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of places where there are not left turn lanes and Grand Hill, as you know, is a fully developed street section and this is basically the last remaining parcel of greater than an acre. Okay, I don't want to get too far in this since it does impact my neighborhood now. Don't want anybody to accuse me of doing something that I shouldn't be doing. So I'll leave it at that. I, I hope you look at that bright and burn instead of tearing, tearing down all those trees, but all right. Any other comments? I'm going to close the public hearing. I recognize Councilman Davis and Councilman Moffitt. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I guess I, I need to um, I have a question to answer about what triggers a traffic light, um, particularly if it ends up being one that is so close to the proposed roundabout. Is, is it possible that there could be a traffic light uh, at the corner of Grandale and Barbie? Uh, again, Wesley Perrin with the city's transportation department. I've not seen any studies or any indication that indicates there's a warrant for a traffic signal. The studies thus far indicate that there would be a benefit providing a separate left turn lane so that left turning and right turning vehicles would be uh, would not be uh, impeding the flow of the, of the other. Um, but you are also correct that if the intersection were to increase to even uh, greater volumes, we would then have to do a traffic signal warrant and one of the concerns that w could very well come into play is the proximity to the, uh, to the roundabout that's downstream. Uh, but this point, I've not seen any numbers that suggest that the intersection would warrant a traffic signal. The first improvement that would be necessary would be the provision of a separate left and right turn lane. Recognize Councilman Moff. Uh, yes, uh, this is for the planning staff. Uh, I was looking, just looking at the development plan, I suddenly realized um, that although the project goes to Herndon Road, there doesn't appear to be any access to and from Herndon Road. Is that correct? That is correct, Councilman okay. Moffitt. Then I have a question for Mr. Ripley, which is why no access plan for Herndon Road? Um, as you can see, this is a very linear uh, acreage along Grandel Road. 
It is part of a, an existing farm, the Herndon, uh, E.H. Herndon Farm currently has cows on it and the cow pasture uh, pond area is mostly the east side of this property which is not what we're developing. Uh, the stub to the west if you'll see it just uh, just north of Huntsman on the west side of the project there is a stub. The, the reason for that is that when that property is in the future developed it, it made more sense to align a road there and tie back into Herndon north of Senator McKissick's house instead of south of Senator McKissick's house. To the, but it looks, if I understand right, your project includes the land that's south of Senator McKissick's house. That's correct. And are you planning to develop that land? That's correct. So but in order for those people to... There is a crossing, a potential crossing of the stream for a street to uh, potentially cul-de-sac uh, at the south side of the McKissick property. Okay. So all these, that, that's what puts all the traffic out on the Granddale, right? At this time, until the future development, yes, this project right. would have all its tra traffic onto Granddale. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Not, the public hearing is closed. Matters back before the. It's been proper to move in second, and I assume that includes the uh, profits and yeah. et cetera. Anything else we need to add to that? I'm asking the staff on this motion. Uh, oh, Mr. Mayor, could I clarify your, for your earlier question based on um, access to the ordinance? Mm -hmm. um, if there are double frontage lots, as, as the applicant indicated, there would be required to be a berm wall, fence, or other, uh, or tree plantings along Granddale to soften the visual impact and prevent access directly onto Granddale. All right. Thank you. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It, it passes six to one with Mr. Moffitt voting no. Okay. Uh, the, the city attorney reminded me we didn't do, we, we do it on this one also. All right. Entertain a motion. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. And we need to go back to item 18 also for the consistency vote. So moved. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? And close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Okay, the next item is item 20, zoning map change, Waffle House, North Carolina 55 Highway Z 14000019. Thank you again, Mr. Mayor, members of council, Pat Young again with the planning department. Uh, this case, C14-00019, Waffle House, uh, NC55, is a request to change the zoning map designation of uh, 1.5 acres of property located at 4203 NC55 Highway, uh, just south of uh, Carpenter Fletcher Road and north of Meridian Parkway, from its existing designation of office, uh, institutional OI, to commercial neighborhood, uh, which would allow for the development of a proposed uh, a Waffle House restaurant. Uh, the request is consistent with the future land use designation in, of this property, which designates the site as commercial. And staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other adopted policies and ordinances. Uh, and uh, Planning Commission recommends approval uh, at its October meeting by a vote of 10 to 0. I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, this is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. Are there questions of the staff by members of the council? If not, we have one person that has signed to speak on this item, um, Sharon Maddox, is that correct? Is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item? It's been a public hearing. If not, Ms. Maddox, you have uh, five minutes if you need it. That's plenty. Uh, thank you all for letting me speak today. I live at 5816 Henner Place, which is just outside of the 600 foot whatever that they have to notify people about. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever been through there or not. I've had, I've lived there 10 years and I've had quite a bit of flooding. The most significant was last June when we had the big flood. Um, I, my house is on a three foot crawl space. It got up onto the floor joists under there. Um, I have some wonderful pictures. Um, my concern is that this is close enough to an overflow area, the stormwater runoff, 
that this could potentially negatively impact not just my house, but several others along Hinter Place and others in this lowland. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever been through there when there's been heavy rains, but Meridian Parkway floods. In fact, across from the existing Waffle House now, <laughs> there is flood water there. I'm not really sure why they're moving the Waffle House, but that's not important now. The two things that I have concern about, one primarily is the water, stormwater runoff, and second is the traffic impact, because there's a lot of traffic going through there now. It's very difficult during rush hour especially. Uh, Carpenter Fletcher isn't, it's a two-lane road going into 55, but just prior, uh, less than a mile above that, is four-lane Woodcroft Parkway, which merges down into Carpenter Fletcher. And then once you cross over 55, you come up a dead end on South Austin, and there's no light, nothing there. And I'd encourage you to go through there at six o'clock in the evening <laughs> if you've not done that before. Um, again, I'm not against the Waffle House per se, but I do think that there needs to be some significant consideration as far as the flooding potential that is there. Um, as I said, south of Meridian Parkway, in between there and I-40, flood significantly. It flooded during the same time that this was, June 30th of last year. Um, I know from a personal standpoint, I lost about $13,000 in repairs and all that I had on my house, not covered by insurance because I've been told I'm in a low to moderate flood risk and I'm not even required to have flood insurance. I do now, uh, but at the time I didn't. And so that's what I'm looking at. The other thing is that we did have stormwater, Durham Stormwater come out and talk with us last year in August. And they looked at it, they did some reviews, and the best thing they could tell us was buy flood insurance. Um, due to topography and all like that, they were not very encouraging about what that could be done about protecting my property or those of anybody along Hinter Place. And so that was a little discouraging, but I'm trying to do what I can um, because it's all I have. Um, I'm not sure what else I can tell you on that, but I appreciate your time and consideration. Uh, at least consider the impact this may have. Uh, one last thing, they did tell us that FEMA is looking at redoing all the flood maps, and while they can't tell me anything specifically, I got the distinct impression that they're gonna put us in a higher floodplain than what we were before, and that's going to include that area. Thank you. You're welcome. Was this discussed at the planning uh, it was not, Mayor Bell. Um, the area in question is not in the floodplain, before, the area that's before you tonight. Uh, and as I'm sure you're aware, and I'm not a stormwater engineer or an expert, but I know our storm, stormwater ordinance will require that both in terms of water quality and volume, that there not be excess of current condition uh, runoff at uh, most uh, rainfall events and very high uh, intensity rainfall events that there could be some increase. Um, in that the property in Meridian Parkway and some of the other adjacent property, as you're probably well aware, was developed um, at a time when we did allow more development in the floodplain. Now there's almost no development allowed in the floodplain. So I think a lot of these historical conditions, that I, I don't, there's no information that makes me think that anything on this property would exacerbate or increase or negatively impact um, uh, the citizen or any of the other property owners nearby. This is a. Uh, this is tough because I, I always have a concern about what happens when we disturb property and create flooding implications. I know the area she's speaking about. I drive that quite frequently, so. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to close the public hearing unless there are any comments. I'm going to vote against. But any any further comments on this item? Recognize Councilman Marfin. <coughs> Um, I just wanted to give you, I, I understand your concerns. I wanted to give you my own experiences. Um, I'm, I'm working on the development of a small grocery store. It's on five acres. I'm amazed at the stormwater facilities that are having to be constructed um, uh, to, in keeping with the, the ordinance requirements that um, Mr. Young was talking about. So I'm trying to reassure you a little bit. On the, and and um, for that five acres, there's two facilities that are underground. One of them is uh, over 100 feet long, 30 feet wide, and 8 feet high. And um, it's a sand filter. They have, they have to maintain it. They have to clean it regularly. The other one is the 
is the holding facility. So one holds the water for a large rain event, and the other filters it before it's let off the site. And that's the kind of thing now with the, with the you might have been reading in the paper about the Jordan Lake rules and the, car, uh, the um, Falls Lake rules. And um, because we happen to be upstream of both of those major reservoirs, we, our development requirements now are pretty, uh, excess, uh, pretty extensive. Um, so uh, while no one can say with absolute certainty that uh, your home, what, what street were you on? Henner Place, it's a small dead end street. I'm on the cul-de-sac at the end, 5816 Henner Place. Uh, basically, I can see Carpenter Fletcher across my back street, backyard, across the ditch that has the stormwater runoff. Okay. Um, in, in any case, while no one can say with any certainty that this won't add to your woes, um, that it, it's certainly not the case that they're going to be able to just pave it, let the water run off. Um, so, uh, one thing uh, I did come before the council several years ago when there was a, prop, a company in Meridian Parkway that was wanting to improve their property, and they were just essentially across Carpenter Fletcher from me. And after speaking there, they did add a, an extra condition that they had to accommodate stormwater runoff, and they did a, add that as a condition of them at improving their property. I don't think they ever actually improved the property, but that was very heartening to me that they at least took that under consideration. We'll, we'll be re rest assured that, that, that the um, requirements have changed over the last few years, have gotten quite a lot more extensive, and um, people do have to accommodate the runoff today. That's good to know. That's very encouraging. Don, any other comments? If not, entertain a motion on the item. Uh, it's been properly moved by whom? The mayor pro tem who second? Uh, I'm doing that for the clerk's purpose. She wants to know who does the motion and second. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? We'll close the vote. It passes six to one with Mayor Bell voting no. Yeah. I hope Don is right and <laughs> things work out for you. <laughs> we Mr. Need mayor, I'll ask a statement you, on yeah, this one also. You, yes. Second. Moved by Councilman Shule, second by the Mayor Pro Tem. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to six. Thank you. We'll go back to the items that were pulled. Oh, I'm sorry. We have 20. Supplemental, Supplemental item. Okay. 22 approval of landlord cert certificate by the City of Durham for the tenant. Shannon SP Associates Limited Partnership. It's been properly moved and second moved by the Mayor Pro Tem. Seconded by Councilman Shule. Moved by Todd and second by me. Okay. Well, <laughs> your voices sound a lot this time of night anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? So close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Okay, thank you. We'll go back to the items that were pull items seven from the consent agenda. I uh, recognize Victoria Peterson on this item. Can 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 you come to the microphone, Ms. Peterson, if you don't mind? This is memorials on city property or right of way. Can I have, can you speak on it, please? Ms. Pearson, could you, ask your could you ask your question so we make sure we address it? What do you want him to speak on? On the policy. Specifically, what is the what policy part? about? And then I would like to say something about it. Bo Ferguson, Deputy City Manager for Operations. This policy was developed in response to uh, council desire for staff to come forward with some guidelines that provides consistency on how we treat memorials that are placed in uh, roadways and on city property throughout the city. I would uh, like to just ask Mr. Baker if you could look over at the first page of the policy where it says um, the treatment and the removal of un unauthorized memorials and if you approve this th I believe that's the wrong word because then you are allowing memorials um, attorney Baker to be allowed place 
on city properties and the public right of way for at least up to 45 days. So how I read it, uh, it's not going to be, I don't think it will be um, unauthorized, but it will be authorized. Um, so, so now after 45 days, when that item has been there, then you're gonna ask the family or somebody to remove it. Um, I really have some concerns even about that, Mr. Mayor. I, I think uh, um, it should be at least even a little longer than 45 days. But also when I read this, um, if you can't get in touch with the family or the person that put it there, um, then the city government will remove it itself. Um, I think uh, we should encourage somewhere on that memorial that there be a name and address of somebody that has left this memorial there, that if the city wants to get in touch with them, that they can. And also, if now what the city is saying to the public, that you can put a memorial on city property or either the public right of way, as long as it's not blocking or hurting or either offending somebody, you can do that for 45 days. That's what this is saying to me, and I don't know if that's what you really want to say here. But anyway, when you say now that you're calling it uh, unauthorized, that will no longer be true. It will be authorized. They have up until 45 days. So Attorney Baker, who I think is doing a good job in this city <laughs> uh, in interpreting the law and our policies, what do you think about this? Is this, do they need to change that wording there? Ms. Peterson, I, I have had an issue with my machine up here, so I'm borrowing the mayor's now. Could you point to me directly? It's in the purpose? Yes, I got it out from your city council book. I just have a question of that oh, first the sentence there by them okay. using the word unauthorized because this policy, this new policy, will authorize it. I, I'm not confused um, with, with it. I'm not sure if, if the staff is confused or, I, that's just not my reading of, of what you just said. So when a, a, a citizen reads this, are you saying now that you have put something in place for memorials? If this is adopted, yes. Excuse me? If this is adopted, yes. That's, that was the purpose of the policy. Okay. So should not you not change that word since this will be considered an authorized memorial? Not every memorial that's placed will be author automatically authorized. Well, if this memorial right. here is speaking for on city property and the public right of way. The only way that it will not be if it is blocking particularly the, the public right of way. How I read it is. Okay. Uh, any other comments or questions on this item? I guess, uh, uh, is she, uh, does Mrs. Peace understand that we're talking about voluntary placement, not, um, a, a, a memorial that would be to a, to a hero or something that this is just spontaneously uh, prompted by people who may have been um, killed uh, along that way. These, these voluntary memorials is what we're talking about here. Yes, but you're speaking, this one here is for government property that the city owns. I mean, where I live at, we have quite a few memorials over at Meduca Terrace right there on the corner that's been there for some time of young men that have been killed. I, I do understand that. It's just my concern about how this one is written. And, and, and Mr. Bonfield, you mentioned, excuse me. Look at it. Thank you. Okay, a motion on the item, please. Second. It's been properly moved by Councilman Moffitt, seconded by Councilman Brown. Madam Clerk, we open the phone. Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. And Ms. Peterson, you had item 13.
13 is FY 2014 Jane Byron Byrne Criminal Justice Innovation Program Planning Grant Award. Yes, the city receives a lot of federal monies um, dealing with crime, and my friend Chief um, uh, my, my Sarvis, Chief Sarvis, who's a very good chief here in Durham, is, and I wanted to, I had some concerns about this. Um, I know the, the community, we have a lot of crime going on, and I know we need to have research and data. I just have some concerns. Why are we using a university in the Greensboro area to collect that data, the criminal data? To, we, we know what kind of problems we have here in Durham with crime. Um, I really would have loved to seen these dollars used to really work with our young people that are seriously have gotten involved in criminal activity in this community. And the police department can partner, and I've mentioned this several years ago, when particularly these funds, when they get the funds from the federal government, they can partner with nonprofit organizations that are doing things here in the community to try to get a handle on the crime. I don't know, um, Steve and Eddie, we've had a lot of gun shooting over the last week or so here in Durham, over there in the McDougal Terrace area as well in some of the other areas. I don't understand why so much of our federal monies are not really used to address these problems and develop programs. A hundred and some thousand dollars, uh, a percentage of that is going to be given to, uh, to the University of North Carolina in Greensboro uh, to do some research on the census track 10.01 uh, I would like to know what track that is. Would like to know why North Carolina Central University was not called upon. They have a criminal justice department. They have a law school over there. Uh, if we're going to use these dollars to collect data, um, my understanding, uh, I'm hoping after that's done that this city council uh, will get that report another report to tell us that we have crime in Durham, another report to tell us we have murder going on in Durham and robbery. I don't understand why we need so many reports, so much dollars are going out instead of Mr. Mayor and city council members bringing some people together in this community and developing the kind of programs for our young men and women to get them out of the crime. Where are the jobs for our young boys? Where are the jobs for our young men, Mr. Mayor, and the other city council? Where is that program thank, developed? Thank, thank you, Ms. Peterson. Uh, could uh, Chief Sarvis uh, respond to why the grant has been used with University of North Carolina Greensboro, plus I see other city and county agencies? Yes, good evening. Ed Sarvis with the police department. Uh, this. This was a referral from the U.S. Attorney's Office to use the University of North Carolina at Greensboro because they do that specific type of research here, so it did not require a request for proposal. Thank you. I recognize Councilman Moffitt. Yes, I, I just wanted to point out that, um, is that, let me ask, how many local dollars, how many Durham, City of Durham dollars would go into this project? None. 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 And that, and that if we if we participate in this, then we can apply. There's a million dollars in funding for implementation that we can apply for. Correct. And if we don't participate in it, then we're just out of luck. Correct. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, at the proper time, I'll be happy to move. Entertain a motion or an item. So moved. It's been properly moved by Councilman Moffitt, seconded by Mayor Pro Tem. Madam Clerk, we open the vote. Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Okay, thank you. Are there any other items coming before the council at this time? Mr. Mayor. Recognize city clerk. Yes. I misspoke on item number 16 as far as the vote that has to do with the Unipole freestanding wireless. Mayor Pro Tem voted no, not yes. Okay. I just want to clarify that. Am I correct, Mayor Pro Tem? Okay. Thank you. Any other items? 
If not, the meeting's adjourned at 10.25 p.m. Thank you.